Okay, I'll call this meeting to order. <coughs> Welcome everyone. Madam Clerk, please read the adequate notice compliance statement. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by the City Clerk's Office in the preparation of the Council Annual Meeting Notice dated December 18, 2023, which was properly distributed and posted per statutory requirements. Please be advised that fire exits are to my right, your left, and at the back of the room. The City has a listening system to assist the hearing impaired. If anyone needs hearing assistance, please obtain it at the, the system at the dais and return it thereafter. Excellent. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. Boyer. Here. Ms. Hamlet. Here. Mr. Miniger. Here. Mr. Pulaski. Here. Mr. Smallwood. Here. Mr. Bartan. Present. President Allen. Here. Okay. Let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please read the explanatory note regarding hearings, comments, and closed session. A closed session meeting as authorized by state statute was announced and held prior to the start of this meeting, and the known items for discussion were listed on the published closed session agenda. Please be advised that council meetings are broadcast live on Comcast Channel 36 and Verizon Channel 30, and rebroadcast on Thursdays and Saturdays on HTTV on Comcast 36 and Verizon 33. When invited to speak, Please come to the lectern, clearly state your name and address, spell your last name, and speak into the podium microphone so that your comments can be understood by all and properly recorded. Whenever an audience or council member reads from a prepared statement, please give or email a copy to the City Clerk's Office at cityclerk at cityofsummit.org. To help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers are asked to limit their comments to approximately three minutes or so in length. Unless you are using an electronic device to follow the meeting agenda or need it for emer professional emergency contact purposes, please turn it off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We will be deferring the vote for the minutes to the next meeting so clarifications can be made. So we're going to move on to reports. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Good evening. The City of Summit is currently accepting applications from Summit residents for its college internship programs through Monday, April 1st. College students majoring in political science, public administration, human resources management, finance, or communications are encouraged to apply for the program. Participants will be able to add significant project management experience to their resumes. Interns will be paid $15 hourly and are required to work 24 hours per week Monday through Thursday for four weeks in the month of June. There are a limited number of positions available in the summer internship program. If interested, please send a resume and cover letter to HR at cityofsummit.org. The deadline to apply is Monday, April 1st. The Department of Community Programs and Summit Police Athletic League are hosting the 2024 Egg Hunt Race on Saturday, March 23rd. The event will take place on the Village Green, located at 356 Broad Street in Summit. Beginning at 1 p.m., attendees can enjoy arts, crafts, music, games, and a magic show. The Egg Hunt will begin promptly at 1.45. There will be three races separated by age, one for children two years and younger, another for ages three to four, and a third for ages five to eight. Not some too old. Following the egg hunt, attendees will be able to take photos with the Easter Bunny and collect prizes. This event is for Summit residents only. Attendees should bring their own basket for the egg hunt. As part of this year's local government week, the city will host a community forum on public safety and city services on Tuesday, April 9th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Summit Community Center, located at 100 Morris Avenue. Residents are invited to view displays and meet staff during the open house from 6 to 6.30. And at 6.30, the Summit Police Department will give a presentation on its home security assessment program, new drone initiative, and other public safety measures. measures. The Summit Fire Department will also share information on its new safety cloud anti-collision technology and provide an update on the new fire headquarters. The Q&A session will begin at 7 with city staff and local elected officials in attendance to answer questions from the public. More information on Local Government Week is available on the city website at cityofsummit.org, including details on the photo contest. Three winning photos will be selected, and each of the three winning participants will receive a $50 Summit gift card. To enter, send photos to press office at cityofsummit.org by March 29th. There will also be a Department of Com Community Programs open house on Sunday, April 7th from 4 to 6 p.m. At, at the rec center. 
come learn about new and exi existing DCP programs, events, and initiatives. There will also be an opportunity for residents to ask questions and share their thoughts about recreation and summit. These two forums are a part of a larger community engagement effort that is being initiated by elected officials and city staff. Later this spring and throughout the remainder of the year, we will provide opportunities for public participation and feedback on city services and more. Lastly, um, I just want to say that it's disheartening to see a small group of people politicizing recent statements on the proposed A4 and S50 legislation and its implication for our city's affordable housing initiatives. The discourse surrounding this matter has deviated from the core of the issue at hand, our collective goal to develop and implement housing solutions that serve an important public need and the best interests of Summit. Political maneuvering only serves to distract us from our shared objectives and the constructive dialogue necessary to achieve them. I urge our friends and neighbors to redirect our focus towards what truly matters, working collaboratively to ensure that Summit remains a welcoming, inclusive, and vibrant place for all its residents. We all want the same thing, to do what is best for our city. Let's come together in that spirit with mutual respect and understanding to make positive strides forward in our affordable housing efforts. Thank you. Oh, yep, there's a couple of seats up here if anybody wants to take, um, there's like three seats up here, so, okay. Yep, oh, is, the, is there anybody out in the foyer? Oh, there is. Do, um, is the TV on? That's a good question. I don't know at this um, point. Is the TV on outside you guys or do you want to come in? Oh, you're all in? Okay, okay, great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Administrator Rogers. Thank you, Council President. Good evening, everyone. Uh, now that the warmer weather is upon us, uh, even though it didn't feel that way today, uh, asphalt plants are reopening, and we are gearing up to com commence with municipal paving operations. Uh, this annual work is part of our commitment to improving city, city infrastructure and the quality of life for residents. Several streets are in critical need of repair and are at the top of the list and will be paved in April and early May. Once we have exact dates, the city will share that information and affected residents will be, informed, will be notified. Oxbow Road and Wildwood Avenue are tentatively scheduled to be milled and paved during the month of April, but the timeline is weather dependent. Preliminary work on Division Avenue will begin in early April and take three to four weeks uh, to complete. Concrete and other infrastructure structure work will happen in May and will be and, uh, and happening in May and more information of it, uh, will be available on the City of Summit website. Uh, the City of Summit is hosting its annual Earth Day cleanup on Saturday, April 3rd, uh, 13th, uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. People of all ages and abilities are invited to volunteer to help beautify city parks and open spaces. Individuals may volunteer on the day of the event at Bryan Park or Martinsbrook Park. Uh, to participate as a group, email event organizers, uh, email event organizers prior to the event to be assigned to a site. Participants should bring work gloves and a beverage in a reusable container. Community service hours are available. Uh, participants should bring forms with them to the cleanup site to be signed by event organizers. Students in grades eight to 12 may attend without a parent or guardian with a signed permission form. For more information, to schedule part, uh, participation as a group or obtain permission forms, please email Summit Earth Day Cleanup at gmail.com. And lastly, the uh, dog park at the municipal transfer station is now accessible to all Summit residents with a valid transfer station permit. The park will be open Tuesday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It is closed on Sundays, Mondays, and holidays. An official naming celebration and ribbon cutting ceremony is planned for later this spring. And that's all I have for this evening. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Administrator Rogers. Okay. Um, I'm not giving any updates tonight, but I am giving a speech. Um, since joining the Summit Council in 2021, and now as your council president for the last 10 weeks, I am honored to be serving in this community. I'm honored to be serving this community in this role. In our first meeting in January, I outlined our priorities that I believe resonate deeply with our community's aspirations, fostering a culture of active listening and learning from our residents, ensuring our collective safety, and promoting compromise and consensus to strengthen unity within our community. I recognize and value the power of an informed citizenry to encourage engagement 
and grow resilience. With that in mind, I had invited Michael Serra, the Executive Director and the Treasurer of New Jersey League of Municipalities, to discuss the implications of the recent legislation A4 and S50 on Summit and the municipalities across the state. At the time, it was proposed legislation, but as of yesterday, they passed it in total. The legislature passed it. The presentation and the following discussions reflect a commitment to informed decision making. It also underscores a collective belief in the importance of affordable housing. Recently, Mayor Fagan, Councilwoman Hamlet, and I represented our community in Trenton to advocate for a pause on A4 and S50. We were joined by many leaders from across the state, from across the aisles, representing municipalities across um, all spectrums who test in advocacy groups who testified and asked state lawmakers to please pause A4 and S50 to just make it better. We remain concerned about the total, um, the potential repercussions of these bills, including overdevelopment, the strain on our infrastructure, and our advocacy extends beyond the legislative debate. We also have to address realistic community concerns as the potential impact of new development on neighborhoods and infrastructure that we often hear residents come to council and share their concerns about. To be clear, no one especially me, disputes the value of having more affordable housing. The question has always been, what is the best way that we can get there as a community and feel like we're not pitting each other against one another? So um, clearly, we can do better, they should have done better, than A4 and S50. Many of you come to this council over the last month to express your concerns regarding the potential installations of, of Tatlock lights and the long-term impact it will cause on increased traffic, pollution, noise, parking in your neighborhood, speeding. Not too long ago, residents expressed concern regarding the, promo the proposed Primrose Daycare that was too large in scope for their neighborhood. It wasn't a bad business, it was just too big, located on an already busy Morris Avenue, which would have led to more traffic, more noise, more congestion, and more pollution. Residents also expressed for the last 18 months overwhelming concern about the oversized Broad Street West redevelopment project and its likely stress on infrastructure, congestion, <coughs> lack of parking, and schools. Our town's charm, which encompasses a beautiful downtown, excellent education, diversity, and green spaces are all qualities that attract and retain residents. It's imperative that we preserve the attributes while also exploring sustainable growth strategies and include affordable housing as part of our new development projects. I would like to clarify my statement on affordable housing that has caused a lot of discussion. I, let me just re-clare that, let me restate that. To clarify my sta statement on affordable housing that has caused a lot of discussion, I value affordable housing. <coughs> I value affordable housing. I value affordable housing. I feel like Andy, actually. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> uh, <laughs> While I am fully supportive of its principles, my reservations on A4 and S50's framework is that it will cause us to do poor planning and that overdevelopment will adversely affect our city. Furthermore, I don't want this to be lost in the process. This is a really important point. We have a state-imposed const fiscal constraint on raising municipal taxes that we can't, do, we can't raise the rate more than 2% annually, which presents significant challenges in balancing development with our commitment to fund services for public safety and quality of life. With car thefts and home break-ins and safety being top of mind for most residents and myself, my com comments in front of the state legislature referenced my concern as to how we balance the potential of building thousands of new apartments, and that includes luxury, while also obligating us to bear, for us, let me say this, 
us, the municipality, the taxpayers, for us to bear all the expenses related to ongoing development that can't be passed on to the developers. I hope that hit everybody's home. The developers do not accrue this cost. We do. And that's what I'm speaking out against. A municipality needs to be able to fund the cost of replacing aging infrastructure, addressing environmental and stormwater damage, in which we have had significant flooding issues with residents that we've been dealing with for months. So there is stormwater damage. There are environmental issues. We also have to hire police. We have to hire fire, or hire fire, fire. <laughs> Um, and city staff as our population grows. If development outpaces our growth and our revenue because we are capped at 2%, we cannot responsibly manage these resources. So clearly Summit and many municipalities across the state agree we need a solution that is better than A4 and S50. As we navigate these complex issues, our focus must remain on responsible, sustainable development and maintaining the essence of the city that we all love. I am dedicated to representing our community's interests and advocating for solutions that harmonize our growth and our priorities and our values. I'd like to thank you for your continued engagement and I trust as we work together towards affordable housing goals, we will make sure they are part of our enriched community. Thank you. Give me one second, I just have to go back. Okay, um, I'm actually going to, I'd like to do historical minute first, if that's okay. So Bob, uh, Councilman, sorry, Councilman Blowski, historical minute. Thank you, Council President. Uh, tonight uh, we have Isabel Jean, who is a senior at uh, Summit High School, mm -hmm. active in the Black Student Union, talented artist, and who will be attending Drexel University next year. To Dragon. and presenting on Florence Spearing Randolph. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Reverend Dr. Florence Spearing, Reverend Dr. Florence Spearing Randolph, pastor of Wallace Chapel AME Zion Church in Summit, New Jersey, from 1925 to 1946, was also a leader of women's suffrage movement in New Jersey. Her involvement in American religion, society, and politics in the first half of the 20th century placed her among the most important women in New Jersey and local summit history. Florence Spearing was born in Charleston, South Carolina on August 6 in 1866. Her father was a prosperous cabinet maker and she, and she graduated from Charleston's Avery Normal Institute. With employment options limited for black women, Florence chose dressmaking and was apprenticed in that field. In 1885, on a trip to Jersey City to visit her older sisters, Florence saw that her dressmaking skills were in demand at a higher price. She decided to move north to Jersey City. The following year, she married Hugh Randolph. Soon, she set up her own dressmaking business in their Jersey City home. In Jersey City, she became affiliated with the African Methodist Episcopal Zion, AMEZ, church as a Sunday school teacher and a youth class leader. In 1892, she was invited to join Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU. This tie led to lecturing engagements and the foundation of an organization involved in the city missionary work. Her Christian and community service efforts came together in 1897 when Florence saw a license to preach. It was granted, although with some opposition from older male representatives. In 1900, she was ordained a deacon and three years later an elder. She organized the New Jersey State Federation for Colored Women's Clubs in 1950, was a member of the Executive Committee, Committee of New Jersey's Suffrage Association, and was president of the Missionary Society of New Jersey. During 1922 to 1924, Randolph traveled throughout Liberia, Western Africa, preaching and gaining knowledge of the AMEZ foreign mission, particularly the educational, health, and service needs in Africa. When she returned home, she brought with her a student, Charity Zumala, who was educated at Summit High School, graduating with honors. In 1925, she was appointed temporary pastor of the small, 35 members, mission church in Summit, New Jersey, known as Wallace Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, and met at the local YMCA. 
Florence's first sermon was given on May 17th, 1925. Three years later, Randolph and the trustees purchased a duplex home at Orchard on Broad Streets in Summit, providing for a 100-seat chapel on the lower floor and a parsonage upstairs. As the membership at Wallace Chapel increased, so did its finance, and in 1936, construction began on the same site for a new sanctuary, Parsonage and Community Center. It was completed in 1937 and remains the church today. Randolph's work in Christian interracial organizations and community service led, her, led to her active involvement in the equal rights movement. As an influential executive committee member of New Jersey's Women's Suffrage Association, Florence was invited by the chair of the New Jersey Republican Party to assist in Warren G. Harding's presidential campaign in 1920. She, she was awarded an honorary doctor of divinity, of divinity degree from Livingstone College in North Carolina. She was the first woman to receive such an honor from the college. After 21 years as a pastor of Wallace Chapel, Reverend Rand Randolph retired from active ministry in 1946. The church, the community center, and the parsonage were all free of debt. She died in 1951. Thank you to the research of the Summit Historical Society and Robert Hagman for the 2001 essay on Dr. Randolph. Thank you so much. going to have Chief Evers please come up to give the new firehouse project update. Thank you, President, Madam Mayor, Council. Appreciate the opportunity to update the fires tonight. We're going to take a little step back in time, um, talking to safety and some members of the Council. A lot of questions about how we got to this point for the fires. We're going to kind of go back. I did this presentation uh, when we first started the project. I'm going to really quickly go through it and just talk about how we got to this point, how we formulated a budget, how the process worked, and I'll, I'll end it with a quick little update on where we stand currently with the project. There we go. So uh, September 14th, after um, years ago, Chris Cotter, years ago, our, our past fire chief, came up with the idea that we're going to need to fire at some point along the line. So 2014, after a long discussion, we did a needs assessment study of our current building. And what that, what that did was it looked at um, can our current building accommodate our needs today and also into the future, and how it compared with industry standards. So you looked at a lot of different components of the firehouse, vehicle circulation, um, safety issues around circulation, um, training features at a building. So all these things, issues came up, life safety codes, uh, gender equality with bathroom and dormitory space. So all these things were, came up um, and they compared to industry standards. And at the end of the day, it told us that we do need a new building. We scored very low. The building is old, infrastructure falling apart, doesn't meet today's modern fire department demands. So with that, um, we took a pause, kind of digested that, uh, talked to some um, 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 engineers and architects and kind of had a little bit of a cost estimate of 10 to 11 million dollars. This was back in about 2015-16. Um, got some ideas, we formulated a new firehouse committee within a firehouse to look at different concepts around the country. And May of 2017, we hired Lemay Erickson Wilcox, our architects who are presently on our project now, to do a feasibility study. What the feasibility study does is it looks at um, what we currently need in the firehouse, what, how we operate, our call volume, um, our equipment and all the things put together, the big spread to be filled out, um, and tell us basically the size of the building we would need based upon what we need for our fire department and the city summit. Also looked at site selection, and at the end of it, we looked at a cost estimate. What do it cost? So a couple of sites we looked at. One site was across from the firehouse. This is the parking lot between the um, post office and the senior citizen building. That was one site that quickly deemed not really feasible to put for operations that are need. And then that drove us to our second site, which was on today, is at the site of the Attitude Community Parking Lot on Broad Street. Um, this seemed the most feasible site. Tra traffic circulation met our needs. The space, the size of the building met our needs to, to work on this site. Um, we also did to ensure that this site was a viable site. A lot of historical um, 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 industry was in this, in this site years ago. We did some uh, boring samples for contaminants, make sure it was viable to, to build on. The, all the stuff passed, came out good. And that brought us to the next phase um, of January 19. We contracted with Limex and Wilcox to actually start uh, designing our project. So we started out with some, um, we also had a, a budget of $11.8 million back then. Interesting note, the $11.8 million was just a cost estimate. We needed something for council and for a future capital planning that has some kind of number there. So based upon our numbers at the time, 11.8 was our number. 
that was just a cost estimate for future down the road. Um, so that's where that love Nate, a lot of people ask me where that, that, that budget came from. It was never a budget, it's a cost estimate on something we put in future capital planning um, in 2019. Um, so uh, the desel design development of the building, we looked at a bunch of different interior designs, uh, how it fits our needs, dormitory space, offices, training components, all those things were built into this design feature. We looked at Apparatus Bay, one of the biggest uh, deficiencies of our old building was that uh, contaminates from firefighters. When firefighters come back from a call, they have a lot of contaminants on them. Our old building severely lacked that safety feature um, with our firefighters' needs. So this building, the first floor, had a lot of components that that kind of um, uh, kind of front line with uh, decontaminating firefighters and keeping them safer in the building. A couple different design concepts as we went through the project early on. This is one of the designs we came up with. Uh, second design, kind of kind of steers back to what we did today, and this is our current design here. So. Throughout this, pro throughout this part of the project, um, we do a lot of value engineering. We would design a certain component of it, take a pause, get cost estimates, just kind of steer to the right direction to try to make, stay within our, our, our budget and build a building that, you know, that, that can uh, last for the future. Uh, this is the project. So after we were done with that, we, the, the um, value engineering team made up of council members, city staff, and a fire department members, engineers, and architects. We all sat down, looked at the, the design we came up with, we probably took off about maybe, I don't know, about maybe 1,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet of building, did a bit of the design, did a little bit of tweaking here and there. Uh, to the point that we thought it was good, the council agreed with, kind of like we liked it, it was a good design. That led us to our next step, which was construction documentation. At that point, the engineers and the architects take, take the, um, the study we had and they put it into a blueprint form, uh, calculations on everything from, from the building that's needed, pretty much preparing it to go out to, uh, uh, to bid. Uh, so in uh, May of 21, we started the bidding process, went out to bid. Um, they had it for about a, a, through the summer. We awarded the bid in September 2021. We had a groundbreaking ceremony in October of 21. We did some permitting. This, this part is just going through all the permitting process with City Hall, making sure everything aligned with all the codes and city requirements. And then we began actual construction in December of 2021. There was some, a little bit of site work that took place between groundbreaking and late December. Took up some asphalt, getting the ground ready to prep for uh, uh, the, uh, the construction. So real quick, um, had a lot of questions on how the bidding worked, why we picked the, why we picked the um, contract we picked. So municipal bidding, it's all sealed bids, right? We have to build a, a bid spec. We put it out to the general uh, community for a bidding. We had 11 bidders come in. We have sealed bids. We have a bid opening. And basically, the lowest qualified bidder you have to go with. That's the law in New Jersey, and that's, that's how it works out. So Brahma Construction was our lowest bidder. We had a couple of add-ons to the budget. The, the, the initial bid was 14670 That was the initial low bid. We had a couple of add-ons, the radiant heat in the floor in the firehouse and the metal roofing for uh, longevity of the roofing. And the, the, award, the bid award was $50,017,650. That went to Brahm Construction. Uh, we looked at this bid. A lot of the bids, if you take out the high number at the bottom, they were all under a million dollars for each other. We felt it was very competitive on the time. This was right on the cusp of ending COVID. A lot of uh, unknown with uh, materials and construction costs. So the numbers were there, they're all pretty competitive. So we figured this was a good, good uh, set of bids that came in. So we decided to award it to Brahma Construction. Um, so our budget, so based upon our bid award, we um, formulated a budget. We had our base bid with our two alternates. We had some remaining architectural fees that took us from construction to the end of the project. We're, we're, we're in that step right now. We had contingencies of budgets. Typically, I've stated in past presentation that 6% is usually a standard for a, a, a billion of size. We chose 3%, we felt very confident we were within that. And to date, on change orders, we're less than 1% of contingency as far as change orders go. So our team, the fire, has been a great job on you know, having control on all the change orders uh, for the firehouse. And then and, and our, our fine, then there was some um, administrative uh, cost, that second 20 cost, and our final budget was a little bit under $16.1 million for the whole entire project. All right, so that's kind of summary of how we got to this point as far as where we stand now. Um, so we are a little behind in the project. The contracts are behind. Very reasons why they're behind. They had some subcontractor issues, material issues, and also, you know, whatever it takes, a product that size. Everything's about 90% completed on the project. Um, biggest piece now is site work. The site along um, the firehouse and the parking garage needs to be completed. But everything is almost there. Uh, we're looking at probably a middle of May, um, construction completion, and then hopefully with all the punch list and final permitting, I'm sorry, final inspection will take us probably to the end of May. Uh, we meet with them um, every week. They come on site once a month, and we have meetings, so we're kind of really 
trying to get the last 10 yards completed. That's the hardest part, getting the project done. So um, quality of work, we're very happy with quality of work. We think you're doing a good job as far as getting quality work with the project. Uh, so we're just, you know, so hopefully we'll stick to that. Made that, 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 that um, time frame hasn't pushed a little bit as you go through it for a variety of reasons, uh, but really put a lot of pressure on the contractor. There are some over costs with that as far as going with budget. There is language in our bid spec that protects the city for it gives an opportunity to go after the contract for any kind of cost, out of pocket cost. We are collecting all that data, and at some point in time, we feel it's best to award them, to talk to them. We'll, we'll talk to them. They haven't put on notice that we are going to exercise that right to go after any kind of out of pocket expense this is incurred from the delay. So that's where it's going right now. So, all right. Uh, we are planning some nice activities. Hopefully, when the building completed, we'll have a, more talk about what that looks like leaving our current building and going down to our, our um, new building to have a nice ceremony. That's all right. So with that, that is all I have for my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Is this um, going to be on the website, Amy? It will, yes. It will yes. be, right? Okay, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Okay, I yeah. would like to open it up to council comments. Council uh, thank you, Chief. I'm excited for you, having visited several times. Uh, one question, was the architect, was Wilcox included in the original price or no? They're not in the bid. Okay. Um, so there was, we, we hired Wilcox back in 2014. So they, were, they had a separate, there, there, there was a one, one little under $1.1 $1 .1 million for Total. the whole entire process to, by the time we started with uh, feasibility to, to current now, that was their price tag for, for okay. the project. That was separate from the bidding. The and we're, we're continuing to pay them right now just because the project ran long, is that correct? I'm sorry? We're continuing to pay them right now just because we are, the length yes. of the yeah, project. There has been some overruns because we had to continue their product management part of it. Other than being architects and engineering, we also had product management. So right now we had to extend that a um, couple times. And that's the money we'll be capturing to go back to Brahma with at some point in time. Got to it. Recoup that money. Okay. I think that is. The, oh, the other question I had for you is you mentioned that we did boring on the site. <coughs> that we have the new firehouse. Did we do any boring at the old firehouse? Just to, I remember uh, you telling I, me I'll we refer did something. That to, there um, are things that may contamination. Been, well, let me back up. Uh, before we started construction, way before, we put new tanks at our, at our firehouse. So right. we, did, we did some mediation work for that purpose. Okay, that's what I was questioning. Yeah, and then back in the mid-90s, we did a small renovation on our firehouse. We did some mediation work then. But as far as, okay. as, far as our new firehouse project, no, nothing in our project. Okay. Did any kind of site work on our current project. Okay, so. thank you very much. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Anybody else? Any more questions? Council? Yeah, um, more of a statement. You know, when, when the mayor and I sat in on the interviews with you for battalion chief and lieutenant, one of the things that really touched me that I, I really just didn't think about, and um, I don't know if most people think about, is the contamination issue. When we interviewed um, the firemen, we said, well, what is your number one concern? And it was interesting, but not really. It was kind of worrisome that each and every single one of them, their number one concern was contamination because cancer, I think, is the highest risk for firemen, it right? Is. It used to be heart attacks, and cancer has, unfortunately, has far more preceded that. Uh, so every year we see more and more cancer uh, line of duty deaths related to job exposure. So that's yeah. our number one. Fires are fires, but afterwards we come back to the firehouse, we live in there. We're going to step back. That's our biggest concern now is things we go back to the firehouse and long-term exposure and uh, get, get healthy down the road with cancer and things of that nature. So yeah, it is a big issue in the fire service right now is cancer and contaminants that we bring back into the building. And, Chief, I know this has been an arduous process and some of which, you you know, going through COVID and different things and contractor-related stuff. But um, the new firehouse, the the difference between the contamination of the old one and the new one, the things that you put in, you know, how much, how much more safe are, are, are firemen when they, when they move in there? I mean, this is a needed thing, right? Tenfold. I mean, we can't, we, we spent a lot of time, and one of the reasons why we chose LeMayer and Wilcox is that one of their team members has had cancer in the family, and they, he's really passionate on firefighter safety, not only on the fire ground back home. So this new building is state of the art when it comes to, um, contamination and decon within our hot zones in the building. So when firemen come back, we have SOPs that direct firemen to take off the gear off, they have to clean it, they're mandatory to take showers, clean themselves off. Certain parts of the building are, are off for any kind of gear that goes into fire. So we have a big, big pathway, a lot of scrubbers, air scrubbers in the building, a lot of fans strictly there to clean it. And everything that's down in the apparatus bays is completely separate from the rest of the firehouse. So no AC ducts, no heating, that's all separate, so nothing can get up into the living quarters of the building. So, but it's definitely, a, 
10 times more safer than our current building is right now. So. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Chief. And yeah, thank you for bringing that topic up. It's a very big, big sense of topping the fire. So I appreciate you bringing that up tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Any other council members? No? Right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You, and I'll probably yeah. in, in, in April, we do another at the State Forum. We do some more updates uh, with the firehouse. So we'll make Perfect. sure we're part of that. Yeah. Great. Thank Thanks you. Appreciate it. Remarks. Right. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. So our next presentation is going to be on um, Tatlock Field Lighting with Director Ozerowski. Um, since there's been a lot of questions and raised about Tatlock Field, we thought it would be helpful to have our Department of Community Programs give a historical presentation as to how and why we got here. Um, many of us are new at this table, including myself, so it's a great way to level set and get everybody on the same page. Is that, are you okay? Is that over as me? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah. I just, yeah, go ahead. So as they work on that, I just want to make sure that we all get level, we have a level set. Um, this is completely looking back. Um, it brings us up to where we are today. It is not future looking. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Nothing more, no, nothing less. So um, when they get everything up and running, that's who we'll have Director Ozerowski up here. Yeah. Everything right? And I just wanted to um, pre it's okay. It's okay. Um, I just want to preface too the uh, any comments we will hold until public comment. So you'll give your presentation, and then I'm going to have people go come up through public comment. Great, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Ozerowski, Director of Community Programs. Um, I'd like to thank or like to thank Council President Lisa Allen, the Mayor, members of uh, the Council, City Administrator Rogers, everybody that's here tonight to listen to myself as well as my chair of my um, advisory board, Sharon Clark, and David Guida will also be chiming in at the end um, to talk about just uh, some certain things with this whole project. So basically, I'm gonna give a historical um, perspective from when this all came about. Sharon's gonna talk about what our committee had, has done in the last year, year and a half, and then David will let everybody know what the future um, next steps in the future is of this whole project. So basically, um, I've been working for the city for 25 years. Um, lights have been discussed um, pretty much since 2004, 2005, 2006, when we put the artificial turf in down at Tatlock. Um, at that point in time, there were discussions and there was a lot of people in favor of putting lights up while we put the turf up. Um, obviously, there was a lot of negativity towards that as well. Um, so our group, um, Kevin Gardner, who was the president of our uh, rec commission, along with Mayor Jordan Glatt, promised the community at that point in time that there would be no lights for that project. Um, but nobody could predict the future. There was never anything in writing. It was a verbal agreement. At this time, while we put the turf in, there will be no lights. Since that time, um, I probably, for the next 20 years, have discussed lights um, formally, informally, um, and we've finally gotten to a point where, um, you know, we brought it out, we've got the community involved, and we're going to continue to engage the community. Um, we've always had problems with fields allocations for the sports groups. Um, Sports continue to grow in this town. Female sports in particular have grown tremendously over the last 10 years. Um, new programs are being added. Um, I think everybody's aware, and I've mentioned it a few times, that the high school team or the high school athletic department um, created a girls flag football team this year, which has about 40 girls participating. Um, we created a youth girls flag football program, which has about 40 girls participating in it as well. Um, unfortunately, our girls, we teamed up with New Providence, 
um, in the youth program, and we don't have field space for them. So every game, every practice this year will be in New Providence. Um, the high school team that has just been formed, they're going to be practicing on the grass field next to Washington School, which is basically a, a piece of land that we have. Not ideal. It's unfortunate for the girls for this first season to be having to practice on that. Um, but that's where we are at this point. Um, you know, another issue just today, the middle school baseball team, which consists of seventh and eighth graders, they're practicing on a little league field behind our building at Longfield, which is, in my eyes, it's a, it's a joke. It's a shame. Um, so that just kind of gives you a perspective as to where we are at this point. Um, the other issues that we've had are the sports are continue to, continuing to overlap. Um, 20 years ago, the only program that played a year-round pro year program was the Summit Soccer Club. Since that time, fall baseball has picked up tremendously. Um, Summit Lacrosse, boys and girls, is asking for a lot of time during the fall, during you know, their non-traditional season. Um, field hockey clinics, traditionally a fall, fall sport. They're looking for more time in the spring. Football, traditionally a, a, a fall sport. They're looking for more time in the spring. Um, we're just, we're, we're overwhelmed with, I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, everybody thinks that's a great, that's great for the community. Um, you know, we just, we don't have the fields to accommodate all the activities at this point. Um, so, in order, in, in order to increase field availability for the sports community, we are, I've, I've, proposed a $1.6 million project to light investors in Tatlock, uh, upper Tatlock fields. Switch it there. Not working? Uh oh. So actually, and it's not 2008, 2006, we had a citywide recreational master plan um, that it's basically the book is probably 300 pages long. I know some people have seen it. Hopefully everybody in here at one point has looked at it. Um, and at that point in time, it outlined field space as a long-term problem that has been exacerbated by expanded seasons, increased travel teams, and increased adult participation. But what they didn't put in there was, again, female sports increasing, as well as new programs that have been added since 2006. 2014, we had a site development plan that was created by Tom Miller um, of Premier Product Development. And in, in 2014, that site development plan had um, tennis courts, bleacher replacements, adding a basketball court, Investors Bank lacrosse practice wall. It had parking spaces. It included Investors Bank field lighting as well as Tatlock field lighting. That was in 2014. The site development plan has been updated. Um, it was updated, updated in two, 2017. The lights stayed on it and there was a couple um, additional items. The track was one um, that we took care of. We, 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 we did the track uh, two or three years ago. Um, new bathrooms were included in there new concession stand, new ticket booths. There's 10 different projects um, that are currently in the site development plan. So we get to October 2, 2018 council presentation. So early in 2018, the DCP advisory board, myself, met with all the sport presidents, the, the athletic director, and we talked about basically everything needs, what can we do to help out our programs, um, and some of the things that were addressed there, as you can see, soccer needed an additional field. That actually got taken care of uh, by Glenside. Um, baseball was looking for an additional t-ball field at the time. That will actually be taking, that will actually happen once the middle school field is done. They'll have an additional t-ball field. Lacrosse wanted um, lights on their fields, and football wanted lights on their fields. So after we met with the group, we had a uh, presentation. Oh, thanks, David. 
these were some of the other, ooh, it's tough to see that, but these are some of the other items that we had talked about. We really looked outside of the box at every area in this town. Um, just some of them, a sports complex at the transfer station, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, sports complex at the Red Cross site when it was being sold. Create fields on the Celgene property. Use the canine space at Glenside. There's 27 different um, venues and areas we looked at in here, and basically all were denied or we couldn't build on them. There's still a couple out there that potentially we could, we could build some field space, um, but it still won't help the issues that we have today. So the October 2nd, 2018 presentation, as part of the, ta the recommendation, recommendations to the council at that point in time, were to add lights on Investors Field and Upper Tatlock, use lights on upper, upper School seven days a week. Currently, the lights on the Upper High School we use five days a week um, until 9.30 p.m. There are instances where we've re requested to use them on a Saturday or Sunday, and we obviously, uh, Dan Healy, the athletic director, had granted us um, permission to use them. Um, as you can see, update the Anderson Fieldhouse. That's actually going to be taking place, hopefully, um, based on the information I received, bids are going to go out sometime in the summer. Work will be started sometime towards the end of the year after the football season. Um, for additional impact, upgrade field and backstop at, at Franklin Field. Upgrade Franklin and Field and the baseball backstop. We're actually looking into that right now with the baseball organization. Create a t-ball field in the cow pasture behind Investors Field. We looked at the cow pasture. If you're familiar, it's the area by Greenfield behind the scoreboard. Um, the, unfortunately, we can't really do much there because the track team uses it for their discus, for their javelin, for their shot put. Um, so the field really gets beat up. Additionally, it stays wet a lot longer than most of the other fields. Um, explore water service at Lincoln. That's another thing that we're in the process of looking at um, to be able to water, water down the infields. Facilitate assessment to move canine to create space at Glenside. So we met with the county. If you're familiar with uh, Glenside Field, the county has their canine units down there. We were hoping that they would be able to move that um, entire operation to another site somewhere in Union County, and then we'd be able to use that space um, they weren't going to move. Um, it's the best location for them to access, you know, all the towns in the county. 78's right by and 24 is. Um, and then support and engage in transfer station development task force. Um, in 2019, a, a task force was developed to look at um, the transfer station to add additional fields. Um, we had a number of meetings and at that point in time, um, there's a number of different factors, but um, fields could not be built on that property. Now, you know, potentially it might be looked at again, um, but in general, the, 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 the layout of the property um, was shrunk due to some environmental, environmental concerns. Some of the um, items at the transfer station would have to be eliminated. So um, there's, you know, there's still areas where you could possibly build one field. Um, but that's uh, it's more of a pipe dream in my eyes. All right, so the management report and goals. So basically every, every year as part of the city budget um, that's created by um, the administration, all the directors send a, a management report um, to city administrator Rogers and basically this report um, explains what you did this this year and your future goals. That along with the capital budget, which um, we have in December, those two items are in the actual city budget every single year. So since 2020, within our management re report, one of our goals was to continue to look, and look at the lights for Tatlock and Investors Bank Field. Um, additionally, in my capital budgets for the last four years, um, I've requested money for in the future for lights in, on Tatlock and investors. So it's been in there. It's, we've, it's been in there. F I took over as director since 2019. Um, it has been in that report 
both from a management perspective as to what we want to do, as well as money I requested for um, capital expenditures. David? And that's what I have for a historical perspective. I'm going to bring up Sharon Clark. She's going to talk about what our subcommittee has done. And then after Sharon, David will come up and finish off the. Uh, this is like a rose between two thorns here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Mark. Um, so in December 2019, uh, we had a funding request to complete a lights feasibility study. So it's important that it's a feasibility study to get this project started. And those funds were um, approved in 2020. We remember we had a pandemic then. And then in Sharon, 20. Will you uh, the, bring the microphone closer to you? Thank okay. you. That's perfect. Thanks. In 20, spring of 2022, um, we signed a contract with, as Mark mentioned, Premier Product Development to complete a study. And the subcommittee was created. And that subcommittee is Mark, David, Elaine Anderson, Scott Lentz, who both were on the advisory board in 2018, and then uh, myself. We met um, with PPD and the lighting engineers, and in January of 2023, we had the results of the lights feasibility study and spent a lot of time reviewing that. And it was a pretty comprehensive report that looked at electric light technology, specifically the diffusion and how the technology has advanced. Uh, the placement, we asked and received comparable sites um, located similarly to where uh, Tatlock is and Investors Field. Uh, information about installation and across the cost estimate. And the committee also spent time um, identifying and talking about other considerations where we knew we needed input and assessing the impacts, such as traffic and parking, the hours the <coughs> lights would be in use, and any environmental impact. And our goal at that point, and continued to be the goal, was to have sufficient information to be able to get fulsome community impact. Um, and all the information that we have is on the website, so the transparency is there in terms of where we are at this point in time. In uh, early February, we met with a small community group. Um, and in March 2024, that project was removed from the 2024 <coughs> capital budget. And then David will pick up on where we are. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so yeah, so we are, just to reiterate it, it has been removed from the 2024 capital budget. So it is not going to happen this year. Lights are not on the table. We know that there's more work that needs to be done. And um, since we started meeting with um, neighborhood members in February of this year, there's been a four-step plan that's been developed that um, has, hasn't been formalized before. But this year, we really focused on formalizing it because each year, the mayor and council do appoint um, members to the DCP advisory board. This board meets pretty much monthly, maybe not over the summers. And when a capital budget, it, when a capital project is identified by this board, working groups are often created. So the first step in any of these working groups is to meet with industry professionals, engineers, and to develop a general plan. Believe it or not, we've been working on this quote unquote general plan, as Mark said, since 2019, 2020, when it was approved to do the feasible feasibility study in the capital budget. So that's a lot of, that's four years that we spent basically in step one. Because before we move to step one, step two, which is engaging with the community, there needs to be some sort of plan. We can't just come out there and say, hey, we're looking at doing lights. How are we gonna move forward with this? That's way too lofty. There's so many what ifs that exist. And we do apologize if the neighbors do feel as though they weren't involved in the process up until this point, but simply there was nothing to get anyone involved in until we had a general plan. So right now we're in step two, which is once a general plan is developed, it's presented to the neighbors of the Tatlock area for feedback. Um, to be totally honest about that, this was something that was kind of 
bubbled up and these community meetings happened even probably sooner than we were ready to have them started because it was presented in the capital budget plan and before it was included in the capital budget, there would have been these meetings. A couple of concerned residents did bring this to our attention and lo and behold, our meetings with uh, Councilman Smallwood, Mark, our advisory committee began in February. So the process was actually helped to be pushed along um, to happen sooner by the residents and we are committed to continuing to meet with residents until we are in a good place. Obviously, we've already uh, received a lot of feedback and we will continue to receive it. Um, step three is once plans are edited and feedback is received from the neighbors of the Tatlock Park area, the next step is to prevent, present the revised plans to the larger community and receive additional feedback. And then after step four is plans are revised based on the larger community feedback and presented to Common Council. So, this is quite a text-heavy slide, but um, we're, we want to be collaborative partners with all neighbors as we go through this process. And um, we want the dialogue to be productive. We want it to be truthful. And we're taking steps, that, we're actively taking steps that will address many of the concerns that have been brought up by the neighborhood. Um, to be very clear on one thing that there's been a lot of conversation about, no decision has been made about when lights would be able to be used. It was stated in a meeting that yes, lights could potentially be used seven days a week, 365 days a year until 10 p.m. But that is part of the community engagement. You start with what is possible and you work your way down to what the neighborhood will be okay with, if anything, should this plan go through. Um, something else that we've seen a Oh, you're good. <laughs> something else we've seen a lot of is um, Memorial Field is not a viable option. There would be a substantial amount of grading work that needs to be done and the fields in order to meet the goals that this Tatlock lighting project proposed would need to be turfed. This would ultimately wind up not being the most fiscally responsible thing to do, costing millions of dollars. Stopping this right in, the, right in its tracks, no secret fundraising campaign is happening that Mark and I don't know about. We're not aware of anything happening and we don't believe anything's happening. Um, the project has not been approved. There is no foregone conclusion that there are going to be lights at Tatlock. Um, we, in the next slide, we'll go over some studies that are gonna be happening and um, talk about that a little more. Night games are not gonna be played yet. I'm gonna actually have you pause. If there's anybody that needs a seat, there's a couple seats we could, um, any elderly people or anybody that wants a seat. There's a couple up front, maybe we can squeeze in. There's one at the end over here. And then Chief um, Sikorsky, can you maybe grab one of those chairs and pull it over to the side if somebody wants to use those chairs? I just want, sorry. I just wanna make sure everybody can get comfortable. Yeah, great. So, and I, we put in here that night games will not be played every week. We don't even expect them to be a regular thing. Again, we're in this exploratory phase of talking to the sports groups, talking to the neighbors, and seeing what everybody really needs to meet their needs and hopefully get to a point where their wants are also met as well. No permits are gonna be issued to out-of-town groups. We are not going to be permitting other groups to come in from out of town and use these fields. This potential project for lighting is 100% independent of the Tatlock playground. The Washington community has not been told that they are going to have to fundraise for whatever is not included in this year's capital budget. If we rewind back to the Maybe Playground project, we received at this point, I think, five grants for that project. It was funded in two different capital budgets. So that's off the table. Yes, would we encourage them to, if they're interested in being involved in fundraising? Absolutely, but that's not true that they've been approached and told that they have to raise that money. Um, one thing that is very true that it's happening, the county is planning to take over the scheduling at Glenside. Um, that's two huge fields that, again, very clearly the county has told us that they don't view that impacting our use of the fields. 
However, we don't, we don't have a crystal ball with anything, so we need to be strategically thinking how we can work past that if there are any bumps across, uh, along the way. And as Mark mentioned, the Anderson Fieldhouse will be renovated. It is being done this fall, so I think that kind of covers all of the things that are kind of out there in the atmosphere. And as things keep coming up, we encourage everybody to please check summitcommunityprograms.com under the um, Parks and Facilities tab. There is another button that says Tatlock Park. It's also on the main page, landing page, a direct link. Those FAQs are updated as we get questions frequently. Again, can't stress this enough, trying to be as transparent in this process as possible. So next steps, where we're going to be for the next year, maybe longer, who knows. Um, we're really driving community feedback. Um, we're trying to keep everything in a centralized database. So we do ask people submitting feedback to please use our um, civic rec system just so we can track all of the feedback received. Kind of sounds like an excuse, but it is hard to manage Facebook comments, manage emails, manage phone calls. So whatever we can do to really streamline this process of feedback, we're giving it a try using our recreation platform. On April 7th, there is going to be a listening session and open house, as uh, Mayor Fagan mentioned earlier, at the community center, talking about all recreation projects, but sure, anyone is invited to come speak about the lights. Something that we are clearly focusing on is small group meetings with the neighbors of the Tatlock community. Um, Councilman Smallwood, Director Azarowski, myself, and our uh, light committee me members right now have four different meetings scheduled on April 4th, April 11th, April 21st, and May 6th to meet with more small groups and different individuals from the Tatlock community and get their feedback. Um, we're excited to be embarking on getting a traffic and parking uh, study done. That study will be done. When there are cars in the area, we are actually gonna go out of our way to make sure it is done when there's a lacrosse game and practice is going on so that way we can get a real simulation of what traffic may look like. Um, I'm gonna skip this next one. The, an environmental study is also gonna be completed. So this spring, these studies are being ordered. They're being completed. It takes time. We'll probably receive them over the summer. Summer's never a great time, so in the fall, there will be one meeting on the environmental impact study. <coughs> there will be one meeting on traffic and parking um, because they're totally different topics and we can get very deep into everything. So to be announced when we'll be meeting about those in the fall when we get results. And finally, field schedules. Something that people understandably keep asking for is a, what a schedule may look like. As uh, Mark mentioned, girl sports really need space. Field hockey is pushed to late practices. There's a lot of things that right now in the um, field ecosystem, I like to call it, um, that don't necessarily make sense, but it's the way it has to be for survival of the fittest. In order for a sport to survive, you need to do things that may not be the most desirable, and um, including going to other towns or having second graders playing until 8.30 at night, which not great things I think we can all agree upon. So a, stud a request for information is out for every single youth sport that uses any facility in Summit. I sent that out last week to all of the sports presidents and um, hopefully they'll be getting their information back to me by April 1st. And then once we get that information back by April 1st, I'm gonna kind of dive in there and look at census numbers, look at where we're going, forecasting trends. And um, the data we're getting goes all the way back to 2019 because we wanna look at the pre-COVID numbers versus post-COVID and do um, a real thorough look at the growth of sports. And from there, we will be able to develop a more robust schedule of what the scheduling at Tatluck may look like should the project be approved. And um, once we get that in the fall, you guessed it, one more meeting on that. So really focusing on the three big buckets of concerns we've heard and um, being proactive um, in mitigating those concerns while continuing to still meet to alleviate additional concerns that may come up. So we'll, we're, we're at least here through the end of the year doing uh, community feedback and um, likely longer. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, before you run, I just want to see if any council members have any questions. Councilwoman Hammond? Uh, just two questions. Thank you, David, um, and everybody who presented. Appreciate it. 
Um, two questions. One is for you, Chief Sigorski. Didn't we just do a recent traffic study down in this area, or safety traffic study? Oh, I'm not sure how to check on that. Okay. Michael, do you remember? Aaron's not here, but I, I feel like we have some data on speed, at least traffic. But maybe a takeaway is I, I, I'm almost positive. Yes. Okay, we did? The answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I we do have, I, I think it's really recent. In fact, I don't think yeah. Director it's like Schrader. in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I don't know what drove I know that. that. I don't remember. Um, but I think it's important to just say for a matter of public record, I think there was recently some sort of traffic study. I don't know what it was for. Um, the second comment was something. Oh, I have a question. When, we were, when we're, we're redoing the middle school fields right now, correct, the inside fields, but aren't they used for really little baseball players? Like what was They're the, used for the baseball <laughs> players. I'm not, but a, I'm not a baseball person. So. Inside then there's also a multi-use field okay. that's also used. So the middle school, so the middle school will not be able to play baseball there. So who will those fields be for? They'll still be used for baseball. They will. Sorry, Mark, I'm just no, confused. No, it's okay. I, I, I know a little yeah. Bit about this. Okay. So basically, the middle school field. There's currently there's a large softball field that the girls play on. Okay. Middle school um, softball. There's a smaller field that the youth programs play on. And then in the middle, there's a multi-purpose that we use for field hockey and we use for soccer. Okay. So they're gonna, those are gonna stay and they're gonna add another t-ball field in the uh, corner. Okay. That way. It's not big enough for middle school baseball, not even close. Right, so I, I'm just, yeah, I, I have a hard time understanding that, but I guess it, <laughs> yeah. I, won't, I won't have you answer. Um, the, the second middle, thing, Middle I school baseball plays on a 60-90, field if right. that makes sense okay. to you yep, the bases are, yep. um, we have three of those in town one's the upper high school field yep. but primarily during baseball season the upper high school fields used for girls lacrosse so, so where are the softball where are the high school softball are, memorial are, so they're pretty limited right they in their high school softball varsity jv play at memorial okay um i think that was all. i actually just got my planning board packet for next week, not to sp surprise the entire public, but that is actually on the planning board agenda next week for the artificial turf that's being put on lower, lower, correct. So I don't know if you want to briefly update the community on that as well, because I don't want it to sound like we're throwing turf in when uh, really the I just want to make sure on the lower high school field, yes. I just want to clarify that is yes. the board of that's that the board, is even though it's the board of ed, I still think it's important yeah. to, yes, I to, just want to you know, clarify that yeah. we don't have yeah. any control. We don't have any that. control over it, but it is something that is going to be in summit. Right. So yeah, correct. Board of ed, they're totally in charge of the whole project. Yeah. It, they're actually going to be starting that soon. I know they've had um, surveyors out there. Mm -hmm. Um, we're hoping it'll be done in the fall or the end of the summer and we'll be able to use it in the fall and there will be five different sets of lines on that field which is the most lines on any field that we have in this town um, so that was it though thank you yep okay thank you councilman Pulaski. thank you um, a couple slides back uh, there was a bullet that said night games maybe one more uh, uh, night, night games will not be played every week. You're only talking about varsity football games, though, right? Correct. And like that goes for like it's not like every week during the spring there's going to be a lacrosse game. Not every week during the fall a uh, football game or soccer game. Okay. Okay. Councilman Miniger, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Do you guys have any questions on this? Side? I do not. No. no. I don't know that it's a question. I think there's just an interesting point though uh, that I think is is <coughs> important to point out right which is that there's basically two different groups of people playing sports in summit right there's the school sports and then there's club sports right so so since you know like for example the board of eds taking responsibility for the lower high school field mm -hmm. right and they they have money in their recent uh, capital expenditure 35 million dollar bond from the schools for uh, Anderson Fieldhouse, right? But like, there's there's nothing in the discussion of lights uh, in the school portion of the budget, right? So so you know, I think we uh, we should we should be clarifying, right? If the lights are to are to benefit all sports, or if it's just school sports, or if it's just club sports, 
And if it's if it's benefiting school sports too, yeah. I really think the school should be chipping in, right? Because what we're talking about here is two different things. We're talking about number one, should there be lights, right, at all? And then number two is it's a huge amount of money, and is it should it be a priority in our budget? I'm glad it's not for this year. Um, but then you know who's who's responsible ultimately for paying for it, and who's benefiting from if they if they happen. So. That's the. So that's to wrong. that point, this goes to my comparison to an ecosystem. Basically, in Summit, our department, Mark Nolly, they oversee all of the scheduling of all of the fields in Summit. So while yes, foot, the high school football team will obviously benefit from the lights at Tatlock, so will every other sport. While maybe not indirectly, it'll give the girls field hockey more time to play on Upper Tatlock or sorry, upper high school, the upper high school field, when they wouldn't be able to play there at reasonable times before. It opens up more places for them to benefit. So, and other groups will be using the field, rec uh, sports use um, the stadium as well. So it's, everybody does benefit. And even with the lower high school being done, yes, that is the Board of Ed property but our sports use that area as well, the nonprofit sports use that area as well, and it benefits the whole ecosystem of the sports. Councilman Small. Yes, um, I, I just had a statement, I don't really have a question. Okay. Um, you, you guys, thank you Mark, Sharon, and David. Uh, you guys did a fantastic job tonight. In fact, I, half of what I was gonna say I had to delete because you guys already covered it. So um, thank you very much for being here. I just want to reiterate the fact that our primary focus remains on engaging with local residents around Tatlock first. Councilman Pulowski, Councilman Mittiger, myself have already met with a few residents since February 7th. The Department of Community Programs remains committed to staying within step two of our four-step process. We have devised a community engagement plan enabling residents around Tatlock Field to register at the Department of Community Programs website for small group sessions on April 4th, 11th, 21st and May 6th. There are still available slots in all four dates. Uh, if you don't have access to website or Facebook page, uh, you can reach out to the Department of Community Programs uh, and schedule and schedule it with Mark or David and they can put you on the schedule as well. So thank you again for your presentation. Great, thank you. I have a quick question. This is a silly little question. So in 2020, the light study was approved. Um, did it come to council for vote? That was, so in 2020, the whole light project was actually in the capital budget. That's what was presented at the 2019 budget meeting in December. It got whittled down to the study. So essentially it did come to council, the um, approval of that study. Okay, so council approved the 50,000. Yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. You guys did a great job. Thank, thank you, you, Sharon, Mark, thank and you. David. Thank you. Okay, um, I think everybody is anxious to speak, so we're gonna go to public comments. At this point in the meeting, council welcomes comments from any member of the public um, of issues that are not on the topic, but I, we can talk about, <laughs> say on the, on, the, on the agenda, but Tetlock Lights, they can say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, because it was a presentation. Um, that you can talk about anything not on the agenda uh, for tonight's business agenda. Whenever you come to the um, lectern, Please read from, and you read from a prepared statement, please provide that to the city clerk. And to help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, we ask speakers please come up only once, give your name, your home address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. And are you gonna time for me? Okay, thank you, come on up. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, my name is Miguel Velez. I live at 113 Mountain Avenue, uh, and I have lived there since 1984. I uh, was brought here by AT&T uh, at Bell Labs, and I am now retired from AT&T and the New York Times. I served a full term on the Housing Authority, uh, two years as chairman, and then on the uh, Planning Board. At the time, I was recommended by a good friend of mine, Councilman Eric Munoz, whom you probably remember, and appointed by Mayor Long. Both were uh, Republicans. But uh, that's what we do here in Summit. We volunteer to serve the city in a nonpartisan civic committees. So I want to thank you all 
for donating your time as unpaid volunteers to help our city carry out its administrative responsibilities. Summit has always been a city that strongly supports nonpartisan efforts to improve the lives of our residents, especially the most vulnerable. We are the home of the Community Food Bank, Bridges, uh, Family Promise, PEP, the other Fellow First Foundation, and lots of other things. Uh, today, for the Summit Housing Authority, uh, the budget does not come from the Summit taxpayers, it comes from the uh, federal government. Summit taxpayers do not fund our public housing. Uh, so why affordable housing, right? Why, why uh, what, what is this about? Who benefits from affordable housing? Well, it's a relative term, affordable. Uh, if you, um, the officer that you're planning to hire in the police department, uh, you have a wreck out, and you're gonna pay 56,000 to start. If that officer has a spouse and a family, that officer would qualify for affordable housing. Uh, <clears throat> so would a teacher, so would a young graduate starting out maybe teaching in our schools. Or so would a senior who is downsizing and living on a pension. So affordable housing is a, is a, a viable option for anyone who is you know, less affluent or somebody who is no longer affluent or somebody who just needs a little help. So, excuse me. So the reason I'm here, last week on March 11th, our council president went to testify at a Senate hearing. Now I know you've made a statement. If you had made that statement last week at March 11th, I wouldn't be here. Uh, last, last week you met at March 11th, now, I'm not speaking for or against the bill, S-50, but I'm here to say that we're totally, totally embarrassed by the uh, statements that you made, inflammatory Council statements President, that you made Mr. Velez is in front of the Budget Committee. Mr. Velez? Council Member, Mr. I'm Velez, going to finish my statement. Up. You're at three minutes. Sorry? You're at three, three minutes. minutes. You're at three minutes, three minutes. Three minutes okay? So, so the Council Member, uh, my three minutes are up? Yes. yes. It was just my last sentence. The council member made inflammatory statements that I think come directly from uh, places like Mar-a-Lago. Now, we have, we, have, we have a reputation in our city, and we're Mr. very Bellas, proud of it. Your time is up. Your, your three minutes are up. So, okay, sir, we're very proud of it. We'd like you to uh, speak well of our city. Thank you. Yeah. And if you can't do that, well then, sir, we'll understand your time the is up. Give me your statement, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Velez, do you want to? Would you like to give us your statement? Oh, okay. Yeah, we have two minutes. Okay. Um, so we'd have to. Uh, Sorry, we just need to remove the sheets and aisles. There's too many egress issues here, so we have to move the uh, chairs. Have to remove that side. Well, <laughs> Council President, Chief, yeah. is the TV on outside or are there chairs outside? I don't think so. Hey, yeah, Chief. Chief Evers, oh, you can't hear outside. Chief Evers, you can't hear outside. Um, so why can, can they just go sit down until they come up? They don't have to wait in line. I don't want people to be leaving the room. I, I think he's concerned about safety issues. Okay, okay. Can we squeeze people in? Yeah. Oh, all right. Can we get, yeah. Yeah, we have seats up here, so yeah. Please. Yeah, and you know what, um, Chief Evers, can they use these seats right here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, three minutes. Here. Hello, my name is Robert Lee. I live at 9 Pearl Street in Summit. Um, I'm a parent of uh, two young boys here in Summit, and uh, we came here uh, in 2020 um, because of the school system. And uh, I've been fortunate enough last year to be invited to uh, assist the coaches on the football field and help them manage the kids. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so to me, the lighting is not about one night or one event here in Summit, but it's about an everyday thing for these kids and how they get to 
um, participate in something that inspires them on a daily basis. Um, I've seen some of the coaches firsthand inspire a team to come back from, from defeat and, and win a, great, a game in a crazy turn turnaround. And um, unfortunately, uh, as, as a coach and during practice, um, <clears throat> there's been darkness and, and uh, that darkness has remained for some of those students. Some of those students, unfortunately, uh, who I believe were some of the greatest athletes in middle school, have um, not been able to continue their participation in sports. They've gotten into drugs a little bit. And so <coughs> to me, I wanted to express that uh, having lights and having an opportunity for these kids to do what they need to do and, and, and grow up and participate in our community is a matter of both of public uh, safety and bu a matter of public health. So I, d I don't think that um, topic has come up much. And, uh <coughs> and also it's a matter of equity because a lot of these kids don't have the same opportunities that some of the wealthier kids do and seeing two really great kids like that fall by the wayside really breaks my heart and I'm sure it does yours too. So um, with that said, I'd like to say for the health of our kids and the well-being and mental well-being of our kids, why don't we let there be light? Thank you. Okay. Name, home address in three minutes. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Matthew Winkler, residing at 108 Beekman Road. As this is my initial appearance before this forum, it's appropriate for you to know that Lisa, my wife of 42 years, and I decided to become residents of Summit in 2006, mostly because Summit High School proved exceptional in cultivating the diversity of its students, faculty, and curriculum in the pursuit of excellence. Our daughter, who was co-captain of the tennis team, among her several extracurricular activities before she graduated, has since attained law and business degrees enabling her to become the co-founder and chief operating officer of an international tech startup and founder of REAP Now, which is a 5013C nonprofit advocating for people seeking parole. I am the co-founder and editor-in-chief emeritus of Bloomberg, where I am employed in my 35th year. Lisa is a former language arts teacher in New Jersey public and parochial schools, as well as a published author. We have three children and 13 grandchildren and remain forever grateful to Summit High School and the city of Summit for supporting values and programs that sustain it as a community inspired by the command to welcome the stranger into our midst, which has its origin, of course, in the Old and New Testaments. And to this day is all about sharing our bounties with those who are in search of safety, love, and kindness. We now come before you at a moment of great concern. When we witnessed the Summit Common Council President, Lisa Allen, during the New Jersey Senate Appropriations and Budget Hearing in Trenton, condemn the commitment to affordable housing. These are her words. The expanding schools, the expanding crime, that has seeped into our communities. Her insinuation that affordable housing is in somehow linked to crime is belied by the facts, which happen to be documented by numerous authorities, including a 2013 study published by the National Library of Medicine. Do affordable housing projects harm suburban communities, crime, property values, and taxes in Mount Laurel, New Jersey? The authors conclude, we find that the opening of affordable housing development was not associated with trends in crime. The University of California, Irvine, more recently said, what happens when affordable housing opens in Orange County? Crime goes down and surrounding property values go up. For the record, Ms. Allen's comment in no way represents our values because what she said 
isn't true. Mr. Weaver. And we hope her position as summit council president doesn't signal a departure from the summit city government's Mr. Winkler, tradition. Sir, your time is up. support for improving the lives of our most vulnerable citizens sir, and always welcoming the stranger Chief, who I'm sure all of you Chief, know get up, was please, Jesus get himself in the book of Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. From now on, listen, it's three, folks have three minutes to speak. You're going to be stopped at three minutes. If you don't get stopped, the chief's going to remove you from the, the, uh, the room. So yeah, everyone has three minutes. Understood. Okay. <coughs> Name, Andrew. home address, and three oh, minutes. Sorry, thanks. Andrew Walker, 242 <coughs> Kent Place Boulevard. Mayor Fagan, Council President Allen, and esteemed council members. I'm a proud resident of Summit since 1998. <coughs> and I'm very invested in the success and inclusivity in our town. As a member of the nonpartisan community group at Home and Summit, I observe, have observed firsthand <coughs> the pressing need for more affordable housing options. It is our collective responsibility to address this issue with urgency and compassion. Currently, at Home and Summit stands in support of the nonprofit Summit Affordable Housing Corporation's proposal to develop 42 units of affordable rental housing on the old firehouse and seven Cedar Street site. This proposal is a practical, actionable plan that meets important needs and obligations of our community. The significance of this initiative cannot be overstated. By providing mixed income housing, we not only meet a critical demand, but also foster a more inclusive environment for our diverse workforce. Consider, for instance, the recent job openings, we heard about this earlier, for police officers. These individuals could benefit from this housing opportunity. Similarly, our educators, healthcare professionals, and public servants deserve the chance to call some at home without facing exclusionary housing costs. <laughs> the proposed housing <coughs> units cater to households earning less than $76,000, offering one, two, and three bedroom units. This aligns with our town's constitutional obligation to promote fair housing opportunities as affirmed by both the courts and the state. Crucially, the Summit Affordable Housing Corporation has thoughtfully outlined a comprehensive funding approach ensuring financial viability for this project. The strong support from residents, business owners, and community <coughs> leaders underscores the widespread endorsement of this plan. Transparency is paramount in matters of public interest, and both At Home and Summit and the Summit Affordable Housing Corporation have upheld this principle. So for those seeking detailed information, I encourage you to visit www.athomeinsummit.org. So in closing, I urge the council to advance this proposal as soon as possible. Thank you for your consideration. Just name, address, and three minutes. Okay. Do you want to take your mask off? My name is Laquisha Jones, J-O-N-E-S. I live in the low-income housing on Glenwood Place. Um, I, um, I first met Miss Lisa Allen at a residence meeting for Housing Authority. I was there to voice my concerns about the conditions of low-income housing, um, the drug paraphernalia, and illicit drug activity that has been witnessed in my complex. Um, I was heavy-hearted when I attended this meeting and considerably worried about allowing my youngest daughter to be able to take out the trash or even do laundry after a certain hour of the night due to unsavory characters that would be lingering, lingering around our complex, specifically by the dumpster area and uh, laundry area at night. I made the decision to move back to Summit 15 years ago, driven by the desire to provide my daughters with a better quality of life, education, than they would have experienced in the city. Having myself briefly attended the Summit school system, I was acutely aware of the advantages that they would gain by growing up here. 
However, recently the changes in Summit, particularly the increase in crime within low income housing and the rest of the city have left me dis disheartened. Instances such as drug activity, car theft, and the rising in property crime threatening the quality of suburban life that drew me to, well, back to Summit. Despite these challenges, I am immensely grateful for the dedication and efforts of Councilwoman Lisa Allen and Councilwoman Delia Hamlet. They have tirelessly collaborated with me to bring about positive changes within our low-income housing community. Together, we have worked towards approving the overall conditions inside and outside of the property while also striving to reduce the crime and drug-related activities. I am committed to continue to work alongside these dedicated councilwomen as we endeavor to preserve and enhance the quality of life for all of our residents in our community and the city of Summit. Lastly, I'd like to say that I am for affordable housing. However, we have a lot of work to do as far as low income, income housing and the sub, subpar conditions Ms. Jones, you're three within, minutes. We live, within we live in. We live in. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica McLean. M-C-C-L-A-I-N, to Weaver Street, Summit, New Jersey. I stand before you saddened by recent remarks made about Council President Allen. I have known Council President Allen for over 13 years. She and her husband welcomed me into their home as a part of their family while I cared for her children. During that time, I never felt misplaced or uncomfortable around the Allen family. Recently, Councilwoman Allen, per, sorry, Council President Allen and I reconnected on a positive mission to make changes in the Summit Housing Authority. Unlike any other council personnel, Council President Allen and Councilwoman Hamlet have put forth counts, countless hours of work into catering the needs of the tenants who live in the Summit Housing Authority. They've assisted in bettering our living conditions, such as contacting our local fire department to fix multiple hazardous conditions that tenants have spent months complaining to the Summit Housing Authority about. I speak on behalf of the Summit Housing Tenants Association when I say that Council President Allen and Councilwoman Hamlet have done an outstanding job with the commitment they've put towards to helping the tenants of the Summit Housing Authority. These women are perfect examples of what dedicated, driven, supportive, loving, caring leaders in the city of Summit should look like. Thank you, ladies. Good evening, um, my name is Nora Radist. I live at 18 Blackburn Place in Summit. Um, first, I wanna thank you all for all of your hard work. I, I do know how hard you work. Um, I have no comment about the, the substance of what occurred in, in Trenton this week, but I do wanna urge all of you from personal experience to remember that when you speak publicly, particularly at a statewide forum, you're speaking for every single me member of this community, whether they voted for you or not. Um, and it, in today's world, you really need to parse your words carefully because all over America, everybody's digging into everything you say and people say in their communities and trying to cause problems. Um, so I just wanna remind you of that. I urge you to remember that you represent everyone, and you've got to be careful about how you, you phrase your comments. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, my name is Julie Broderick. I live at 2 Sunset Drive in Summit. Um, I'm here to talk about the lights. Um, 
I think we can all agree that the subject of lights on Tatlock has caused a lot of emotion and debate. From the stop the stadium signs, the exclusive Facebook group dedicated to the lights issue, and personal discussions with some of the organizers against the lights who are actually present tonight, I've learned that this topic is extremely important to the residents around Tatlock Field. By talking and listening to you, it was helpful to learn that you are open to Friday Night Lights, but you, that you have significant concerns about lighting the fields all year round. You have concerns about noise pollution, increased traffic, reckless driving by teenagers who are staying late at the field, and a potential decline in your property value. Just talking and listening to you, I get it. I understand the concerns you have about lighting on the field. My one ask of everyone who is, against, who is dead set against the lights right now is that you try to keep the dialogue open. I truly believe that if we can all come to the table with an open mind and a willingness to understand the opposing viewpoints, we can get through this topic with less heat, less hyperbole, more communication, and more compromise. Let's have a civil discussion with each other without the spread of misinformation or even worse, the misrepresentation of any past discussions. We all love our town, and we want what's best for our children and our community. I know that we can work this out. Thanks. Thank you. It's Barbara Bevelo Hode. I've been a resident of Summit since 1995. Could you give our, your address, please? 61 Way Drive. Okay. I'm part of the Tatlock community, but I'm also representing Summit. The comments of opening statements from Mayor Fagan and Council President Allen in terms of quality of life and decorum didn't go unnoticed on me. Because this is really, the lights at Tatlock Field are a quality of life issue. And I respect the fact that we have needs of a community in terms of sports. But one of the things that we talk, was talked about here tonight is the traffic study. Traffic studies need to be conducted, certainly during Friday Night Lights, and other big games because a fire engine could not go down the block. And people are parking on both sides of the street. So that is a complete safety hazard. Teenagers drive and not necessarily very experienced. No, secondly, in addition, the noise from that loudspeaker comes into my house three blocks away. So the noise of that loudspeaker is deafening. It's not attractive. And I think when we talk about compromise, I heard about compromise here tonight, but we also need to discuss the quality of life issues. Because the quality of life is not just for people to play flag football. We moved here for a safe community. As someone who's raised children here, someone who's lived here proudly for many, many years, I think we have to take a look at what the impact would be on thousands of people surrounding that field. And the risk that is involved with the traffic and the speeding, I'll, right, right now I'll ignore the beer cans that show up on the streets, okay, which is unacceptable in this community. But it is the safety of the community that is greatly being put at risk by populating that neighborhood with those lights seven days a week, five days a week, four days a week. And I do appreciate the public acknowledgement. The Am I out of time? No, 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 please speak in the microphone. And I appreciate the public acknowledgement that a commitment was made to the community that no permanent lights would be put on Tatlock Field. That was a commitment. I witnessed it. I lived it. And, it because, and so people have to do what they say they're going to do. And if for the fact that is acknowledged here tonight by the community leaders, I think there's no other discussion because a commitment was made. And last time I made a commitment, I kept it. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Claire Toth at 11 Sunset Drive, 
As the weather gets warmer, I'm again encouraging council to pass a resolution closing the two downtown blocks of Maple Street for the 2024 summer season. As other New Jersey communities have demonstrated, this is a simple, straightforward process. Red Bank, which has closed its downtown streets for many years, well before the pandemic, is a good example for Summit to emulate. Red Bank's police chief, who until recently was also its acting city administrator, says that because Red Bank does not close state roads to achieve their downtown street closure, New Jersey DOT is not involved, and DOT has acknowledged this. Be, um, this means there is no annual process needed to achieve a street closure in Red Bank. And because Red Bank closes a street that abuts a county road, much as Maple Street abuts Springfield Avenue, they notify the county, but that's it. Last year, Milburn closed downtown streets during the warm weather months, calling it the pedestrian mall. Milburn's equivalent of our SDI undertook an informal survey of users, and that's what I've distributed to the, the people, on, the folks on the dais. The words that most often came to visitors' minds were fun, community, lively, friendly, welcoming, relaxing, and friends. Isn't that what we all want for Summit? Favorite features included live music, public seating, and outdoor dining, all of which a seasonal closure of Maple Street would provide. Imagine little kids drawing out hopscotch games on the, on the street and making new friends while their parents enjoy seeing old friends with a renewed sense of community spirit. Importantly for our downtown merchants, mall visitors reported spending an average of $88 when they visited the Milburn Mall and further reported that they visited other businesses in town because the mall attracted them. In fact, we do have some good feedback from Summit residents as a result of two surveys conducted a few years ago, one by SDI and one by now Council President Lisa Allen, that overwhelmingly showed Summit loves Destination Maple. Summit moms and dads, grandparents and visitors can all sit out under the stars while their kids play cornhole in, or chess, and for a little while, everyone feels young. A seasonal closure of Maple Street is not complicated. It's a win for our downtown, and it's a win for Summit residents. Sure, we can address placemaking more in depth during the next master plan revision, and we should. Until then, let's keep doing what worked so well and make so it even better. Minutes. Destination Maple is a place where Summit families can come together. Thank you. Thank you. Name, home address in three minutes. I'm Danny O'Sullivan, 33 Crescent Avenue, and I served on the Common Council from 2020 to the end of 2022. Thank you, Council President, and thank you, Mayor Fagan, and Council members for serving. I know how hard you work to try to improve everyone's quality of life. I'm here tonight because my name has been mentioned at several council meetings this year regarding my role as council liaison to the Community Programs Advisory Board and the issue of installing stadium lights at Tatlock. I'm concerned that by this council mentioning my name, you are implying that I am endorsing the installation of stadium lights at Tatlock. That's not true. Let me be clear, I am opposed to the installation of stadium lights at Tatlock. My first year as liaison to that board was spent dealing with the implications of the COVID pandemic, renovations at the Summit Town Pool, deciding whether or not to open the pool when surrounding towns chose to keep theirs closed, running summer camps, and the status of the city's playgrounds, among other things. While we did speak about stadium lights occasionally, we didn't spend any significant time on it, especially that first year. It was not our focus. In late 20 or early 2021, our Summit Athletic Director, Dan Healy, joined one of our board meetings over Zoom to discuss lights at Tatlock. I asked him directly why he wanted lights at Tatlock, and he very directly answered and said, we, meaning Summit High School Athletics, do not need lights. He also added that the Summit High School football coach prefers to play all the football games on Saturdays at 1 p.m. He went on to say that the lights are for the private sports clubs like football and lacrosse. And isn't it obvious? In the $37,429,555 board, 
Board of Education capital spending plan introduced almost two years ago, there is no money allocated for lights at Tatlock. The Community Programs Advisory Board recommended a lighting study to look at electricity supply and foundation footings. And also because I and most members of that board knew very little about stadium lights. For instance, I didn't know that each light tower needs to be 70 or 80 feet tall. I didn't know that the cost was 1.6 million, which in my mind is an unwise use of resources. Along with the obvious impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods, these factors have led to my opposition of the project. Let me just add that the capital budget meeting that takes place every December is a presentation that is open to the public and is a wish list of projects that each department head would like to pursue. My first capital budget meeting was in December of 2019. The parking service director's presentation included a wish list item of a down payment of 1.5 million for a parking garage at the corner of DeForest and Summit Avenue. There's no garage there now and probably never will be. Mr. Also Sullivan, keep in mind, minutes. thank you. Also keep in mind, the installation of stadium lights at Tatlock is a capital budget item that Director Ozerowski wants. That's why it's been on his wish list for a number of years. And that's okay. He should have a wish list. There have been some really great Mr. Sullivan. items. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Sorry. Thank, thank you. you. It'll be in the minutes. Thank you. Jody Campbell Dillon of 269 Ashland Road. Um, I live here with my husband and my five sons, and today I'm here as a mother and a, a citizen of this, of, of this town to, on behalf of um, Lisa Allen, our council president. I am horrified by what I read in, the, in NJ.com calling our volunteer, and I thank you all very much for your service, um, your volunteerism, and, and all you do for our town. I am horrified by statements being made that are conflating two very different issues that are both very important to our town. The affording housing, affordable housing bill that, was, that you spoke about on, the council pre, um, president spoke about on March 11th, was relating to the way the bill was written. We cannot, as humans, as parents, as um, citizens of Cit Summit, allow conflating of issues that are both very real, very important, and need to be discussed separately, and the bill, both can be true at once. The bill as written may not be what we want in summit. That is what Council President Allen was there to speak about. While her words did not come out as she may have wanted them or as intended, we cannot conflate those words to what is in her heart and who she is as a person. She cares about this town. She cares about our children. She cares about all of us and every person on this on the town council and every citizen in this state and this town. We care and everyone's here just believing in what's right for Summit. We may not agree. We often don't agree um, on how it gets done, but we do agree that we are good people, that we are good humans, and we have to believe that people are out to do what's best for them, for, for their town and for their family. Please do not conflate issues. Please do not call name call. We are not DC. We are not part of this country. Summit is a wonderful place where people do listen. They take what they've said, they look back, I appreciate your statement, I believe you, I hear you, and I, I do accept your apology and we're, that we're learning from this, but please do not say horrible things about anybody on this, on this council. We are all here and, and we, we appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. Good evening, Diego Hoyk, Nan Argal Court. Last year, President uh, Greg Bertan allowed his neighbors to air our views as long as we needed, even if the rules allowed limiting remarks to three minutes or less. Excuse me, I reclaim my time. Let me share one of many. Shh, 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 shh. It's okay. Sure. May I start again? Just, no, you yeah, cannot. just keep an eye on me. Sure. On okay. May 2nd, 2023, then candidate Bob Palowski spoke for five minutes about the importance of free speech. He waxed poetically. Our city is engaged, we're at the dais. Summit neighbors remain engaged as we can see. This year we have asked for a redress of many grievances, from an ordinance of questionable legality which worries many local leaders, to our desire for outdoor dining and the suitability of lights at Tactock Field. And it seems that as our engagement grows, public comment rules become more restrictive. 
Four weeks ago, Council President Allen opened public comments by asking his residents to keep our comments to three minutes, quote, if possible, end quote. Two weeks ago, Council President Allen changed the rules stating, quote, at three minutes, I will ask you to wrap it up, end quote. Today, we're threatened with, ex with expulsion. Also, two weeks ago, the restriction was not applied evenly. A Chatham Councilwoman expressing a position in line with what the council majority wanted to hear was allowed to speak uninterrupted for four minutes and 10 seconds. In contrast, Tadlock neighbors speaking, seeking redress for grievances were shown a sign at the three minute mark and given a few extra seconds to wrap up. Also, this council has restricted our comments to one per meeting, unlike the Vartan-led council of last year, which did not apply such limits. Bob Palowski was allowed to speak twice at the June 7th meeting last year and also at the July 18th meeting as reflected in the respective minutes which I include. In contrast, four weeks ago when I attempted to speak a second time, Council President Allen stated, quote, we don't do two times at the lectern in public comments, end quote. Councilman Falowski asked last May, quote, since when did it become uncivil to ask hard questions? It is not, and I have two of my own. How do these unevenly applied changing rules and increased restrictions res reflect the transparency, proper process, and due diligence the new administration campaigned on? And two, if council genuinely wants to apply a time limit, why not install a clock that's visible to all, ensuring transparency, transparency and fairness? Thank you. Name, home address, and sure. three minutes. Sharon Nash, 7 Aubrey Street. First, I just want to say thank you for all volunteering all of your time. Um, so one thing I wanted to bring up regarding the lights at Tatlock is that I think it's positive for the community as a whole. Um, and I actually live right behind Tatlock, and Washington School is, in essence, just behind my backyard. So as we've, uh, I'll, I'll stick to my speech here. Um, so um, I think it's positive for the community as a whole to realize the Tatlock track and field after dark. Um, uh, let's see here. As a working mom, I like to walk in the evenings, but at times I cannot, I'm not afforded the opportunity. Once, you know, I come home, see what the kids need to do, take care of dinner, and then it's dark. Um, and as women, I don't feel safe walking at night. Funny enough, I don't know if you remember, Jody, about, I don't know if it was a year ago, a year and a half ago. Oh, sorry, it was about a year and a half ago or so. Um, I was walking in Upper Tatlock. I was, okay, there was um, a lacrosse practice at the field, so I said, okay, I could safely walk around upper Tatlock while lacrosse practice is going on, and then when they left, I'm like, okay, I guess my walk is done. So I would really like um, lights at upper or lower, because it gets really scary, and you really can't see who's more than like five feet away from you, because they just kind of come up. Um, and actually, most importantly, besides my walks, um, is I have right now two high schoolers, and um, I would love my kids to have access to fields at night. My son loves to play pickup soccer, whether it's early or late, um, I know in the past they've used their phones to play um, spike ball in the dark. Um, they're constantly just coming through my house getting like pickleball rackets or soccer balls, and I think it's great for them to do something useful as you know something positive for the kids and for the community, and honestly more even not organized games, but just place for the kids to hang out safely that's lit and that is safe. Um, and as we've been talking about the lights, I've started to pay attention that the tennis courts are lit up, which, which actually you know, I, I really enjoy. And also, um, Washington lights are on all night. I never noticed that before, but I've been paying attention. And it's actually nice. And the other side note is, I can see upper tat lock from my upstairs window. And I actually love, if anybody knows me, watching and seeing where my kids are. So I go upstairs just to see, oh, there's Max. You know, and then I could be like, okay, he's good. Now I know where he is. So I actually wish I had access to lower the tat lock from my window as well, which I don't. But anyway, um, and I actually think that, you know, I love where we are just because we have tat lock, and it would be great to have use of it at night. But thank you all. Thank you. Name, home address, in three minutes. Hi, my name's uh, Mike McTiernan. I live at 11 Blackburn Road here in Summit. Um, uh, Madam Mayor, Council President, uh, members of Council, first, uh, thank you all for what you do. I know this is um, a volunteer job, and a lot of times you don't get a lot of credit for all the hard work and stuff that I know all of you do. Um, I was a Council uh, member for six years, and um, I still tune in. Uh, I wanted to come up because I was watching the Council meeting uh, from two weeks ago, and I was struck by what Council Member Boyer said um, around comments that 
were being made around not just himself, but other members of council. Um, it's always obvious to see when people begin to lose an argument. The obvious sign is when they start name calling. Um, and we've seen that, unfortunately, in our community. Um, there was a, an issue about a law. Some people liked it, some people don't. That's fine. We live in a democracy and we should be able to debate issues. However, it is not okay for people to start to insinuate that people um, uh, have ulterior motives that border on racism around that. And council people have been called that online, um, in public, by online trolls, um, anonymous letters to the editor. These are with you know uh, low intellect, vapid commentary, and these should always be called out um, for what they are. Um, and it's, it is disappointing that our elected officials don't say it right away from whatever political party. Our leaders in our town, whether you're from the faith community or from either party, don't call it out while it's happening. It shouldn't have to come as an apology after an, a council member makes a statement up top. It should be called out for what it is. It has no place in our community. You guys are doing the job because it's the best that you can do for the right reasons that you can do it. Um, on that, I'm just gonna pivot to uh, this affordable housing issue. Um, I wanna thank the mayor, council president, and councilwoman Hamlet for going down to Trenton. Um, I appreciate your comments at the beginning of the, uh, the evening, council president. Um, I know you individually. I know you as a person. I would, ra I would hope in our community we give people the benefit of the doubt for what they are trying to say, not to jump on them and attack them for something that they might have misspoken about. Um, that, I, I think we would all deserve that to happen to ourselves, okay? So um, what I do appreciate is that you went down there speaking for Summit. Two things can be true at the same time. Mr. McTiernan, you're three minutes. Okay. You can uh, like affordable housing and you can agree that bill is horrific for Summit and you can advocate against it. Thank, Thank you. you. Michelle Kalmanson, 67 Butler Parkway. I'd like to talk a little about compromise. In the last council meeting, Mayor Fagan, Council Member Allen, and David Guida talked about finding a compromise on Tatlock field lighting. Every time I've heard a compromise discussed, it involves reducing the hours from 10 p.m. to 9 or 8.30. On the surface, this sounds like an even compromise, splitting the difference between sunset and 10 p.m. But it's not even at all. The residents surrounding Tatlock are being asked to give way more than the sports community. To demonstrate the difference, I'm going to talk a bit about something that hasn't really been discussed, property values. That's right, I'm going to be a NIMBY and complain about my property value. One of my neighbors heard from a realtor that stadium lights would depreciate property values in the surrounding area. Out of curiosity, I did some reading and found that home appraisers have a term for this type of thing, external obsolescence defined as depreciation caused by factors off the property and beyond the homeowner's control. As an example of this, homelight.com says, nearby eyesores or high noise levels can lower your home's appraised value. In case you're thinking, how bad could it be? Or I'm sure these lights wouldn't be that much of an eyesore or a nuisance. I want to hammer home how close some of us are to the field. My house and some of my neighbor's houses are 70 yards from the proposed light poles. That means a 70-foot light pole will be closer to my son's bedroom window than it would be to the end zone on the other side of the field. And if you really need any more evidence that these lights would be undesirable, just drive down my street and look at the Stop the Stadium signs. So now let's try to put a number to this external obsolescence. Specifically, let's look at houses that would be most effective, affected. This map shows all of the houses that are within 200 yards or two football field lengths of where a stadium light would be installed. I've also limited this, limited this to houses that would have an unobstructed view of the proposed stadium lights. Does anyone want to guess how the total property value of the 66 homes highlighted on this map? It's $91 million. 
There are 66 homes within two football fields of the proposed stadium lights valued at 91 million. In reading about external obsolescence, I found that the effects can be 5% on the low end to 25% for things like living next to a garbage dump. To be conservative, let's use 5%, although it may be worse for some of us. 5% would mean that a million dollar home would lose $50,000 of value. I think it's probably reasonable to say that a million dollar home would have a price would have to drop its price to $950,000 to sell with something undesirable across the street. So with our $91 million estimate, as soon as stadium Ms. lights- Ms. you're three minutes. Yeah, I think she's gonna hand off to her husband. You can, you can yeah, give her a statement if you'd she, like. I'll, I'll, she's handing off. I'll take over for her. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, she Name and address. Name and oh, address. Uh, Miles Calmonton, um, 67 Butler Parkway. Three minutes. All right, okay. thank you. Um, all right, so picking up where Michelle left off, um, so with our $91 million estimate, um, the 5% uh, uh, decrease in home value would end up being $4.5 million. And we do have a slide for that as well. Um, but this is just the immediate drop in value. This is as soon as the, uh, as soon as the lights go in, the homes drop in value 4.5, but I'd like to look at it over time. Um, so uh, on average, US home prices increase by 4.6% year over year. So what does $4.5 million difference become when we take into account the difference in appreciation? Um, Councilman Smallwood, I, uh, I've heard this is up your alley. Um, can you tell me what $4.5 million would become with 20 years of appreciation at 4.6%, uh, assuming we compound monthly? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Keep looking no. at me. No, no, no. I'm sorry, <laughs> right, you, can't right. the, you can't pull crowd, the Tough crowd, tough <laughs> crowd. All right, it's $11.4 million. Um, and I have a slide showing the, uh, showing the projection here. Um, now, does that seem like a fair compromise? The Department of Community Programs is giving up an hour or two to field time, while the surrounding neighbors are sacrificing $11.4 million in property value over the next 20 years. Um, I'd also like to finish by saying that for a plan that's been in motion for six years and is expected to cost $1.6 million, I'm shocked at how little anyone has been able to articulate the need for stadium lighting. I keep hearing we're short on field space without any evidence other than some vague or hypothetical situation to back it up. In fact, the DCP's um, website with their FAQ has just one example of how extra time could be used. I challenge DCP to provide a proper document describing the need for stadium lights, what alternatives have been considered, and the full impact on the neighborhood, including financial. Before asking taxpayers to put up $1.6 million and members of your community to sacrifice $11.4 million in value of their homes, we deserve a more compelling argument than, let me make sure I get this right, we would like to move second, third, and fourth grade girls field hockey practice from 7 p.m. to an earlier time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kalman. Thank you. Mr. Kalmas, I, I no, did. No, I sorry. double no, checked. No, your your math is correct. It's eleven point eleven point four. Oh, okay. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Hi. Hi, I'm Maggie Bauman, Forty Lewis Avenue. When we bought our house in two thousand, we recognized that lights could be added to Tatlock Field. It never occurred to us that the plan would be created by a subcommittee with no representation from the Tatlock community. One of my guiding principles is to always assume positive intent, but I'm having a hard time doing that here. On March 5th, I emailed Mark Ozerowski and Councilman Smallwood about pickleball. I suggested adding courts at Memorial Field and had a question about the court reservation system. Mark told me he would talk to the AD about the courts and copy David Guida to answer the reservation question. <coughs> 14 minutes later, David replied, quote, this is something that we will probably need resident feedback on. There have been lawsuits in municipalities surrounding pickleball courts because of the noise it brings. There are several homes very close to these courts that will be impacted, end quote. Fourteen minutes after asking about pickleball at Memorial, a town employee said they would need resident feedback. Resident feedback for a little paint and the same noise that comes from Tatlock every day? Fourteen minutes for someone to express concern for the Memorial Field neighbors. The Tetlock light conversation entered the public record in October of 2018. Over the past five and a half years, did no one think about resident feedback for this multi-million dollar lighting installation? How is that possible? It's not. Of course they thought of the neighbors. The meeting agenda from the Tetlock lighting subcommittee in September 22 lists, quote, ancillary nighttime items. 
parking, noise, trash, lighting curfew, vandalism, teen issues, drinking, etc. end quote. So there was thought, but no one took action to involve neighbors for one simple reason. Whoever is pushing this through wants it done and has no concern about neighborhood impact. This is an oversized, reckless plan for Summit that will permanently damage our community. I have to say it reminds me of Broad Street West. Council members talked about taking a field trip for the maybe playground work. I recommend you do the same here. Fortunately, you don't need to go anywhere. The DPW can place their portable lights across the street from your house. The lights will turn on at dusk and then off at 10 p.m., night after night. Each member of council and their neighbors can have a turn enjoying the lights. Council President Allen stressed that she hears the residents' concerns and is committed to transparency, referencing prior council measures that were pushed through without community support. Councilwoman Hamlet reminded us that this council did not initiate this plan. That's true, but you own it now. To prevent tat like lights from becoming this council's Broad Street West, you must hear the neighbors during the upcoming meetings. Start the traffic study right now as spring sports begin. Release the redacted DCP advisory committee minutes. President Allen, I would like to take you at your word, but I'm from Missouri. This council is going to have to show me and my neighbors that you have the political courage You're at three minutes. to do what is right for those who will be most impacted by this unnecessary project. Thank, Thank you. you. Name, home address in three minutes, please. Okay. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Fagan, Council President Allen, and members of Common Council, Jim Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, 38 Fairview Avenue. Uh, I've appeared, uh, be I'm going to pivot to a different subject. I've appeared before this council before on <coughs> uh, the subject of municipal debt, and I, uh, I attended the uh, budget meeting on this in December, and my, I'm just here for uh, gather information. Uh, what are the uh, next steps in the budget process, and... Uh, uh, when will the public get a chance to uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, to uh, participate? And uh, will members of the finance committee uh, uh, be open to meeting with me privately? Thank you. <laughs> well, oh, do you have good. a statement? <laughs> no statement. You caught okay. me by surprise there. No oh, <laughs> Jim, you dropped your pen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name Hi. is Mary Higgins. I want to thank you so much. Mary, for what is your oh. home address? Oh, no, you're, no, no, the oh, other one. You're right. Okay, home I live address, at 14 Oak Ridge Avenue, Summit, New Jersey. I have five sons. I've lived there for 30 years. Uh, during COVID, the sewers failed on Oak Ridge Avenue. You're right, in the summer, there's nobody anywhere. If it wasn't for Lisa Allen, I would have a distressed husband with no hair. But thanks to Lisa, she was able to get it coordinated and get us situated. On top of that, I had a bill for 100,000 for my last son graduating Georgetown. And get, just getting back to Summit and sports, my children didn't get to use the Summit schools because uh, as we all know, the principal told us, boys, school is not meant for boys. They had to go on Ritalin or I had to leave. I couldn't believe it. We left, we went to Catholic school, cost a fortune, but they still got to participate in the sports as a summit resident, even though your children do not go to the summit schools, you do get to enjoy them. And my, all my boys went on to play sports in college, high school and college. So for that, I'm very grateful, thankful to you. And it's just been tremendous to have you. It's just unbelievable the amount of crime on Oak Ridge Avenue and that area. It's, it's beyond belief. I feel like I'm back in Brooklyn. It's crazy. But to have you as a direction just know that we're working on things and that contact person, you take the calls, it's a godsend. The other thing is the traffic. We need a traffic study over by that hospital. It's growing by leaps and bounds. They're responsible for all the sewers canceling out because they're just not worrying about the infrastructure. So I just want to give you my point. I'm very thankful to all you here. I'm so glad that you're accessible to me and my family, and maybe we'll stay now and <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But thanks again, and Thank I appreciate it. God Thank bless. You. Bye. Hi. Hi, I'm Lori Rufolo, R U F O L O. I live at 51 Wade Drive. I've been there 28 years. I've, I've raised my children. 
I've had a wonderful, wonderful life. I love my Tatlock Field community. We're a walking group, we're a friendly group, and I love it there. I really feel, I'm here tonight because I feel my, the impact of the quality of my life in Summit will drastically alter with the lights. I had the unfortunate circumstance of having a wonderful barbecue at the same time there was a game. First of all, the loudspeaker, I am three blocks away. I'm three blocks away from Tatlock. And the loudspeaker is so phenomenal that with my windows closed or being outside, it is very bothersome. Um, the rest of the noise is unbelievable too. Um, so yeah, it really impacted our family barbecue that day. Um, the other thing is just coming home during a game, it is difficult to get down the streets. There are people walking. There are cars parked on both sides of the street. It is a safety hazard. Just getting to my house on the day that there is a game. Um, also, uh, just walk, I cannot even go down <laughs> to that area and drive through like I would normally do. I have to reroute myself in order while there's a game going on. So I do feel it would really impact the quality of my life. Um, and uh, it's a matter of safety, it's a matter of noise. Uh, it, I feel like the entire area would severely change and be impacted. So I hope that you could be very creative and find ways that the children could play sports and not impact other people's living around Tatlock. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Henry. Hi. Henry Bassman, 18 Hartley Road. Uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to everybody who was involved with taking the $1.6 million off the capital budget. I think that was a very wise move and a very fair move. Thank you. Second, I want to say that I'm a fan of community programs. My oldest son uh, goes to summer camp. My uh, oldest grandson, I should say. My two grandsons participate in TRICAN, and I've worked with David Guida for years on the Memorial Day uh, commemoration and it's a group that works very hard and does very good work. But I'm afraid in the rollout plan for the community engagement, there are two fatal flaws. Before I mention them, let me tell you that I'm sure you're gonna make a judicious decision, but as you get along the process, I'm gonna follow Ronald Reagan's advice. Trust, but verify. And I'm sure that the other people who live in the area will do the same. Okay, first flaw. Conducting environmental and traffic studies in the spring is laughable. Nothing happens in the spring except for summit relays and the high school graduation. The time to conduct those studies is in the fall. Three football games and two lacrosse games at least that way you have a good idea of what the impact really is on the community surrounding Tatlock. Second, there's a notice about the community meeting that's supposed to go to people who live within 200 feet of Tatlock. That's ridiculous. That would only include portions of Butler Parkway, portions of Lewis Avenue, and a small portion of Aubrey Street. The area that's impacted I estimate, and I may be off, but I estimate goes from River Road to Beverly Road and Woodland Avenue to Morris Avenue. A more appropriate distance from Tatlock is maybe 1,200 to 1,500 feet, not 200. So those are my two comments. I want to thank you again for being judicious and being fair and I hope and expect that you will be in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Name, home address in sure. three minutes, please. Hi, uh, Elliot Fishman, 34 Webster Avenue, uh, Summit. I do not have any prepared remarks. I don't have any speeches to make. I'm just gonna say this extemporaneously. A deep appreciation for everyone sitting across the da dais. dais. Uh, there's a lot of decorum here, there's a lot of civility, there's a lot of listening, and it makes for a harmonious community. And we're very grateful. Lots of us, of 
either political party, crossover voters, independents. We just came out tonight to say thank you, and we appreciate everything you're doing. That's it. Thank you. Can I use some of these? Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you again. Um, I appreciate the name, time. home address. My name is Carlos Hernandez. That's H-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z, um, 85 Butler Parkway. Um, last time that I was here at the prior council meeting, there were references to the 2018 meeting, so I went kind of like took a look at that in YouTube. Um, and, and of note was that when they were discussing the various options to add to the sports field space in Summit, when referring to expanding the use of fields or lights in existing facilities like Upper High School and Franklin. Um, Elaine Anderson provided some of the sense of the impact to those communities as a result of the proposed enhancements. But in making the recommendation of adding lights to investors fields and Upper Tatlock, a much impactful idea, she merely supported a recommendation by tagging it to the Tatlock for development plan and omitted providing any notion of impact to the neighbors in the area. When asked by a council member uh, who led this in, in the question by saying he thought based on the experience there would be community interest, she noted um, no community engagement had taken place. She then tried mitigating that by noting that there was input from sports residents who were community residents. She went on to talk about technology, light technology as being a key differentiator from past similar discussions about turfing and adding lights to summit fields. She pointed to the tennis courts at lights uh, at Tatlock as a perfect example of technology, which is concerning because the lights of do spill over considerably. Even the superior technology from Moscow, which is what is being considered now, would have a dramatic impact on the community when referring to going from having no lights to having them. It was also observable from the video recording of that council meeting that, I was, that it was not well attended, a, a well attended gathering um, and, and no one from Tackle community um, was, was alerted to the discussion. The absence of that was clearly explained by Elaine Anderson's own acknowledgement that there had been no preliminary outreach to the most impacted neighbors in reaching the recommendation. From what I can discern from that summit council meeting is that the council as a whole minimized the impact of the community programs advisory board proposal on Tatlock um, residents. This week, and I also observe Council President Lisa Allen's oral testimony when she was um, used the initial feedback from TAC block residents to make the Council's case against A4, A4 and S50 bills. I'm not going to talk about the community, um, you know, the affordable housing project and your opposition to those bills, but you actually did use our statements and you gave the impression that it continues to be the Council objective to minimize the concerns of our community. Um, even if that's not what you meant, that's how we, that's how we came across in your, in your remarks. You specifically- Mr. Fernandez, you're at three minutes. You specifically talk about the impact Please of the plan. Please wrap up. You're at three minutes. I minutes. thought I had 30 seconds after no, three no, minutes. You have, you have less than time's that. Up. Okay. Please, you are going in community engagement. Do not minimize the concerns of the community you. in your plans. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi everybody, um, my name is Teresa Solano and I live at 38 Lewis Avenue. Once again, I'd like to ask the DCP to add the complete September 27th, um, 2022 meeting minutes to their Tatlock page that includes the ancillary nighttime items in the spirit of transparency. Since the start of March, I've hated that my husband and I, and I personally have contacted the Summit Police four times via phone, C-click fix, and an email regarding the safety on the Aubrey Street Lewis Ave curve by Tatlock Field regarding illegally parked cars in no parking zones with dangerous traffic on both sides of our street in broad daylight. I know that multiple neighbors have as well. We're only six days into spring sports. Councilman Pulaski has seen this firsthand. This is not the quality of life anyone in town deserves or moved here for, but it's important for the safety of the 25 plus school aged children on our street. This residential neighborhood and insufficient lot space is not designed to handle the parking, buses, and traffic flow, as former Chief Weck agreed. Adding 70-foot stadium lights to one field, let alone two proposed, is irresponsible and wrong. It was shocking as I sat in City Hall last month asking questions and threw out if lights had ever been considered at Memorial Field. Director Ozerowski said the neighbors would have a fit. I appreciate that Council McTiernan brought up that concern of the neighbors in that 2018 meeting. 
why should that park or any other green or turf um, or upcoming turf be afforded any special consideration for their well-being and their quality of life while the Tatlock neighborhood is being steamrolled again? Last time I checked, we pay into the same tax system that the rest of home homeowners, the entire city of Summit, do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Yeah, please leave, uh, say your name, address, and three minutes. Please. Yes, Alexis Baylor, 42 Lewis Ave. I'm here for Tatlock Lighting also. I live three houses away from Tatlock. Um, my husband and I moved to Summit in 2021, and when we initially looked at our house, the first thing that we asked the neighbors was the impact of the field. Uh, this included whether or not there were lights or nighttime events. We heard then about the agreement the town had made with residents not to light the field. It was a huge selling point for us, as was the fact that the field directly behind our home, the cow pasture, green field, it's been called both, would not be touched. We now have a toddler and an infant, and we absolutely love living next to Tatlock. It's an incredible environment that shows how vibrant the Summit community is. We're looking forward to our girls growing up to play sports there. However, we are extremely concerned about the prospect of lights being added. Not only is it an eyesore, it also poses dangerous dangerous issues for us and our children. The traffic that we get on our street on event days is extremely frustrating and hazardous. I'm not sure of the results of the traffic study that was recently done, but if you come on any event day, you'll clearly see Lewis Ave becomes a one-way street with cars entering in both directions. To be honest, at the curve of Aubrey and Lewis Ave, this happens on any given day with students and coaches parking there. The addition of lights will continue this problem late into the night. It doesn't seem fair that our neighborhood has to carry such a large sports burden for the town. There was earlier talk about maintaining the character of our town. This should apply to us too. The Tatlock community is getting squeezed by all of the increased activity and development on Morris Ave and River Ave, and inviting more visitors at extended hours will just make it worse. It's very frustrating as an avid sports fan that this seems to be shaping into an anti-sports narrative if you're opposed to the lights. That is not the case in any way. We're just trying to keep our own children safe and pre preserve the Tatlock community that we love. There was a previous comment made about the health of children and how the lights would decrease drug use. I frankly do not see the connection, but I have to believe that those concerned about the safety and well-being of children would understand that they should not be playing sports until 9, 10 p.m., especially on school nights. Additionally, it does feel like pandering to continue to emphasize that one of the main reasons that this is needed is because of the increase in girls' sports. I have two daughters and will have absolutely no problem if they're forced to play on grass or have to go to a neighboring town for a practice or game. Finally, I understand there are no definite schedules, but if you truly don't expect regular night events, why are we spending this money? It would only encourage more games, more visitors, and more safety issues. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name, your home address, and three minutes. Hi, Mimi Zukov, 49 Way Drive. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? Mimi, Mimi Zukov, 49 ah. Way Drive. Mimi. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I have lived in Summit for close to 40 years. I've lived on Way Drive for 35. I'm an environmentalist. I serve on the Environmental Commission. I'm the chair of the Recycling Advisory Committee. I'm a founding member of the Summit Area Green Faith Circle. I'm very concerned about a lot of environmental issues in this regard. I spend a lot of time walking in Martinsbrook Park and picking up trash in Martinsbrook Park and along Butler Parkway. It's disgusting. And it's much, much worse after there's been a, some kind of a big sporting event. The, um, the light, the light pollution, it's not good for any of us and especially for the people who live right around the field who have young children who need to go to bed at night, they shouldn't have to get special light reducing window treatments because this is being imposed on them. A lot of people have mentioned that we were assured many times over, over the decades I've lived here, that the, there would not be permanent lighting at Tatlock Field. And we never dreamed that there would be another sports complex right on the upper tap lock. The plastic pollution that washes down into the storm drains, I don't know if anyone knows this, it washes right into Martins Brook, into the Passaic River, which is our source of water. 
it breaks down into tiny little particles that are so small that it cannot be filtered out. Everyone should be afraid. And I don't need to tell you, if you live in the neighborhood, that both Canoebrook Parkway and Butler Parkway are speedways. And I can't even imagine parking on both sides of Butler at night and parents parking across the street and waving to their child, come over here, honey, I'm here to pick you up. And the kid darting across the street and getting hit by a car going 40 miles an hour on Butler Parkway. And speeding is not enforced in our neighborhood. Never has been, I don't believe it ever will be. That's my comments. I really hope you don't do this. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Reverend Rod Williams. 116 Glenside Avenue Fountain Baptist Church. I'm speaking as an African American and I want to admonish around the notion of code speak that in essence oftentimes when we hear about affordable housing it has now become one of the new buzzwords as used to be terms like busing. And uh, as recently as November 23rd of 2021 New Jersey passed into law legislation requiring the removal of discriminatory language from deeds and homeowners and condominium association documents. The practice of inserting racial covenants into real estate contracts, which has been illegal since 1948, but was still present in some documents that haven't been vetted, as this law requires the removal of discriminatory language from all deeds recorded on or after January 1st, 2022, and from the governing documents of homeowners and condominium associations. I share this information as an abject history lesson of the commonplace practice of redlining that occurred across the state, some included, and this is why we should hope that any opposition to affordable housing would be tempered with grace from those who realize that as opposed to maintaining such segregation that was enacted along racial lines, there would be good faith efforts to eliminate those boundaries and embrace a more diverse community that, that would, than that which was created through those despicable practices. And finally, Councilman Boyer, I also stand to take issue with a statement that you made at the last council meeting, which was recorded, where you stated that at a previous council meeting, you were told that you were not black. I was at that meeting. I don't recall that at all. As the topic of the language of the resident protection ordinance was being discussed, you addressed me with a question saying something to the effect of, I guess we can agree that I'm black, to which I responded with a gesture that neither required me to confirm or deny your ethnicity. So I don't know why you felt that that was something to question any more than your repeated questions at the last council session that the affordable housing component isn't meant to diversify Summit, something you asked on two separate occasions. So sir, if you care to recount an exchange for the Republic record, then it's important that the recollection be accurate. And if you ask questions that appear to appease negative stereotypes that you don't do it in an attempt to score biased political points. Thank you. Thank you. David Ciccone, 147 Summit Avenue. Hi, Madam Mayor, Council President, Councilman, thank you for hearing me. I'd like to echo some of what was just said before me, but a lot less eloquently. Um, I was watching this council meeting from my couch a few moments ago, and I was compelled to get off my couch and run down here, um, literally, because I couldn't watch one more person come up and apologize for the Council President's comments at Trenton about affordable housing. Uh, I couldn't watch one more person apologize and make excuses on her behalf. Um, I couldn't watch one more person call out people who speak truth to power and call out racist comments for what they are and malign those people who are actually speaking up and saying the right thing. I'll avoid the R word. Uh, I know it gets people really upset and they kind of shut down, um, but those comments at the very best were classist. And let's just speak plainly. You are a council president. You are capable. You wouldn't have that seat if you weren't. Uh, you went there with prepared comments. We know what those comments mean. You know what they mean. We know what they mean because people have said them before. It's not the first time they were spoken. Uh, they have a very specific meaning. And I think we all need to do work a little bit harder to ignore that, rather to not ignore that, and to recognize that and be honest with ourselves. Thank you. Lacey Cotter, 123 Summit Avenue. Let's be clear, when you, Mayor Fagan, Council President Allen, and Councilperson Hamlet went to Trenton, 
you, Council President, delivered prepared remarks rife with dog whistles. Dog whistles that were not so subtle. In fact, they were so blatant that they, were, they elicited passionate reproach from state senators in the room. And when Mayor Fagan had the gall to say, please leave the decisions about development to the people who are directly impacted, well, that resulted in a scathing op-ed by Tom Moran of the Star Ledger that has works. severely damaged Summit's reputation. Council President, your statement, the words you chose so carefully, let's hear them again. There will be no escaping the noise, the pollution, the cars, the expanding schools, and the expanding crime that has seeped into our communities. Look, studies show over and over that responsible suburban development, uh, responsible affordable suburban development uh, does not create more crime and more noise. Well, not unless laughter is noise. In the 20 plus years that I have lived in this town, I have lived most of my days within two blocks of one of Summit's affordable housing communities. I walk my dogs through it. I used to have a big red girl, now I have a chunky little brown one and a huge Great Pyrenees, and pretty much they're kid magnets. Kids always come over and pet them and say hi, and seriously, there is always a good game of tag or manhut going down over there. When families have access to affordable housing, the reality is there are tons of positive outcomes. Increased savings, increased credit scores, reduced total debt, and building affordable housing in Summit, which is your obligation, mind you, means access to quality education, amazing sports and theater programs, a vibrant community with arts and culture, after school programs at the Y and PEP, and downtown where kids can still work jobs at pizza places. Those are the people, Mayor, that are directly impacted. And isn't that the American dream? Isn't that what this whole experiment of America is even about? We heard earlier this evening how much planning, years and phases for Tatlock Lights from the Department of Community Programs. It makes me wonder, what kind of plan do you have in place in the works right now to meet these obligations? Now is the moment for this council to meet the third round of affordable housing obligations. Obligations, not suggestions, that must be taken seriously or our community will be in the crosshairs of a lawsuit that will result in a building that far exceeds what the proposed Broad Street West ever was. Crosshairs that the three of you made certain were focused on Summit when you went to Trenton and delivered your deplorable remarks. Uh, Katie Isakovich, 51 Butler Parkway. Um, I want to ask council to take a few steps regarding the lacrosse wall before it goes up, kind of similar to what was done with maybe playground and the instruments there. Um, I, I have a concern that uh, there hasn't been thought regarding um, the, the noise of the, the balls hitting the wall. I, I just want to put that out there that um, before it goes up, if something could be done to mitigate that sound, I have this concern that, you know, because nobody spoke up at the council meeting where it was announced, and we, we've kind of been talking about <laughs> that a lot in terms of, you know, both the, the Tatlock lights in 2018 and how that compares to Broad Street West, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I want to lay that to rest. Yes, that's true. I was not at the council meeting where the lacrosse wall was first brought up. Um, I had just moved here. I had an infant at the time. Now I have an infant and a toddler. And my concern is that now not only are the events that currently take place at Tatlock going to steal their sleep, um, but also now we're going to have balls hitting a wall at any given time and, again, more nap time stolen. So I just want to ask that that be given some consideration and before this becomes a reality, something be done to mitigate the noise that that is likely to create. Regarding the stadium lighting at Tatlock, I would also like to comment on council members and DCP coming to the Tatlock community a few times requesting a compromise in exchange for our buy-in. But we understand that the current arrangement was a compromise. The Tatlock community supported the turfing of upper and lower Tatlock on the basis of council agreeing not to ever install permanent lights. And we do not agree, as some council members have suggested, that the commitment to the turf was permanent while council's commitment not to install lights was temporary. That is not an equitable agreement that the Tatlock community would, would have accepted. 
So when DCP put together that Tatlock Lights Committee in 2018, the Tatlock community was not monitoring for this action um, in council meetings because we understood that we had an agreement, permanent turf for permanently not having lights. And this committee, from our perspective, is a committee whose purpose is to figure out how to <coughs> violate that agreement. Um, from our perspective, council and DCP no longer like the existing compromise and agreement, so they haven't acknowledged it and have demanded the, a new compromise, which is not a logical ask. Council members have even admitted that any agreement made would be good for only as long as council doesn't like the agreement anymore. And then by a simple vote of council, the agreement, even if supported in an ordinance, will disappear. And that's all it takes to remove an ordinance. The lights won't disappear, but whatever was promised to the Tatlock community will certainly disappear in time. So while we're talking about, you know, not having a game every week or having the lights off by 8 p.m., how soon before that changes? You're at three minutes. Please wrap up. The Tatlock community already shoulders you have 10 seconds. the disruption enough. So we ask that it be more evenly spread across the, the town. Thank you. Please just state your name, your home address. Uh, Danielle Lee, 17 Butler Parkway. Um, I would like to share some of the uh, pains that I'm already experiencing as a Tadlock resident. So the Tadlock community is already, sh uh, is already shouldering a pretty big uh, burden for the community already, for the entire city of Summit already. Asking more is not acceptable. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three points, traffic, light pollution, and uh, noise pollution that I'm currently experiencing already. So on the traffic, the traffic's already intolerable right now on Butler Parkway, particularly since the road was narrowed. I never knew why the road was narrowed. It looks better now, but people park on both sides of the Butler Parkway, which is essentially creating a one-way traffic on Butler Parkway, and whenever there's events. I don't remember how many times I have to just stop to allow for the incoming traffic to go through. So it's essentially a one-way traffic. It's very dangerous because people kind of speed down from Morris Avenue. And uh, when they come down, they, they don't realize because they were like going down hills. And it's just very dangerous because it creates a lot of like um, blind spots for me as well. People are blocking my driveways. Uh, I can't back out. Uh, even when I'm back out, I can't see very well where I'm going because there are like a lot of cars. So, um, so I think this is going to be much worse if we're going to install the, the stadium lights, right? For sure. Um, we're going to be more traffic. So the light pollution. Um, my son's bedroom is right across from the upper Tadlock field. The, uh, there's already light on upper Tadlock field, and it looks pretty sufficient to me at this time. I'm not sure why there's a need to have more lighting, especially really tall lighting. Uh, and, uh, and especially if, it's, if you know, it kind of requires millions of dollars of investment, is it like a wise use of money for the city, right? Um, and the noise pollution. Uh, people love playing loud music when they're playing spots. Uh, like having loud music after our kids' bedtime is gonna definitely be a huge um, impact to our quality of life. And kids shouldn't be really playing spots after bedtime anyway, right? Why would some kids are out playing like at 10 o'clock at night? Uh, that's defeating the purpose of having spots, right? So that's hurting their house. So um, the Tadlock field is a sports field, not, ju not just someone's backyard where they can just stay as long as they want. Um, so a promise is a promise, verbal or written, even though it was made by previous leadership. So I'm really um, asking this leadership to consider that and honor that promise and find other alternatives to the Tadlock uh, lighting project. Thank you. Thank you. Letterman, uh, Clark Street, 27-year summer resident. First, I want to thank Lisa and the other newly elected council members and recently for their grace and composure in the face of these idiotic, divisive tactics by a couple of demented individuals whose only mission <laughs> is to cause chaos and drama. No one is falling for it. I don't think they even believe their own nonsense. 
Your calm leadership is truly inspiring and is precisely why you were all elected. Thank you. But getting lost in all the phony race baiting is some really good news. Somewhere, I really don't remember where, I thought I overheard that the Beacon Church wants to subdivide the two acre Red Cross property and build a 100% affordable building like the at home and summit one on it with some of that two, 20 million building money they've raised. If this is true, and I really wish somebody was here from the church to speak about it, uh, it would be amazing. It couldn't be in a more perfect location, nice, nicely integrating low-income residents into one of the best neighborhoods in Summit that's walking distance to a public school, supermarket, and train station. I applaud the congregation for living their faith and not just wasting all that land on a monumental building and trust that this is one application that will be unanimously, unanimously approved by the zoning board. This would be a great time for somebody to speak about this, to break the news and tell us about how you are putting your faith into practice. It would heal the, help heal the divisiveness caused by the cruel and morally reprehensible racist NIMBY accusations. And thank you for adhering to the three minute. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Lederman, do you want to give your speech? Just make a general statement oh, okay. to anybody who read from the statement. Okay. If they haven't already submitted it, please do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. Okay. Hi. Name and a home address, uh, Hi there. I'm Kimberly McGovern. I live at 142 Colonial Road, and I'm a 18-year uh, resident of uh, Summit. Um, I originally had no intention of getting up here and talking. Uh, I just quickly type something up on my phone while sitting in the back row. I am on the executive board of the Summit Boosters, um, and as sitting in that position, I'm involved in communications. I've been asked about the lights, to which I realized I was poorly informed. Um, I've heard a lot of different rumors, all of which on both sides I now realize were all wrong. So I applaud the council and so I'm wrecked for doing that uh, presentation to lay out really where we are right now so we can all be on the same page uh, going forward. Okay, so um, I'm in favor of the lights, but I'm also here to ask both sides of this issue to remain open and to truly listen to each other and to be open to compromise. I live about three blocks from Summit High School. The field there has lights and it is lit up at night. I cannot see the lights in the sky from my home. However, I'm grateful to know that they are there. I have four children, and all four of my children have used the fields there, uh, the upper field, for both organized and unorganized sports. Uh, my sons would regularly meet up with friends for a pickup game of touch football, uh, maybe for some ghost in the graveyard, you know, you name it. But I was I've always been very grateful to know that I have that extra space for kids in the area to meet up and play. So as someone who uh, would, I would always assume would, uh, that having lights on a local field is actually an improvement to property value, um, I certainly would see it as such. I have a larger, because it's a larger outdoor space that you can be using. Um, I'm excited to think about another space for early evening activities for children outside and away from devices as I equate light with, light with safety and I equate my kids spending time outside in the fresh air with health. Um, there are numerous games at the upper high school field and I've never felt put off by the presence of fans, buses, players, and the noise. I really miss Friday night lights and the fun crisp fall evenings with the community when we all come together. I feel like this is such a positive evening and um, I really think it's <coughs> priceless. As far as street parking, I can attest that this town council will work with residents of the neighborhood by passing parking measures to make sure parking isn't an issue. Not this council, but a council prior listened to our area and work with residents. Madam, you're three minutes. Okay, thank you. So in closing, I'm just asking everybody to listen and to be open and to be open to compromise. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Please state your name, your home address, and three minutes. Yes, good evening. 
uh, Blake Scalette, 105 New England Avenue. I'm also the pastor of St. John's Church at 587 Springfield Avenue. Thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, I stand before you uh, thinking as a pastor, person of faith, of some words of scripture. One that least came to mind for me was the, uh, the meditations of our, the, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts. Uh, a lot of things have been said about things that were said. One thing that you said tonight that really made me so happy was that you said, I'm for affordable housing. I'm for affordable housing. I have, uh, as a pastor in this town for a dozen years, spoken to every time I get a political candidate or a politician in front of me, the topic I want to talk about is affordable housing. As a pastor in this community, I have seen people struggle with housing at every level. Our church, through Summit Warm Hearts, brings homeless people in literally off the streets two nights a week. I've had members of our congregation who have been decades-long senior residents who are literally facing imminent homelessness. I called your predecessor, Mayor, uh, to say, what do we do? And, and was angry, irrespective of the party, what are we going to do in this town to fulfill our obligation to all of its residents? We are a wonderful community that should be ever expanding to both meet the current need, and it is a current need, teachers, police officers, nurses, most of the clergy can't afford to live here. But also, this is part of our best moments of being a community that dug in and did the right thing. So I don't want to talk about what hasn't happened. I want to urge you to move forward. How are we going to put more affordable housing for all of its people in this community now? The At Home at Summit program sounds like a pretty good one. I urge you to do the hard work to see if this is the right thing right now. Don't put it off. Move forward right now. If it's not, let's find the right one, but let's do something right now. People need this. Our community's health needs this. Summit is stronger together with all of its people, rich and poor, all together. Thank you. Thank you. in Modesto, 61 Butler Parkway. Uh, so my comments are also focused on the proposed lighting at Tatlock. Um, at the last council meeting, after public comment, Councilwoman Hamlet referenced an October 2nd, 2018 meeting, which I later viewed. Thank you for pointing out that meeting to us. As you observed, there were only a few residents there. So to characterize that presentation by Eileen Anderson as a presentation to the community is a gross misrepresentation. When Ms. Anderson was asked whether there was any initial community outreach, she said only the sports presidents were talked to. When Council President Nadu asked if there were any resident comments, there were none. I can assure you and the rest of Council that in 2018, we were not silent because we had nothing to say about the proposed lighting project. We, as the negatively affected Tatlock community, were completely unaware of these progressing plans that will have a detrimental impact on our daily lives. It is an unreasonable and burdensome expectation that every resident is looking at every meeting agenda and attending every budget meeting for anything that may remotely affect them. Your remarks at the end of public comment last meeting suggested we should have been doing just that. For then, we would have caught the three times in the past six years that the potential lights at Tatlock were discussed publicly. This is a large project that would affect those in proximity to the field in a very real and very damaging way. So the burden should not have been on us to look out for this project. However, that sentiment only proves the point of my last public comment. The Tatlock community cannot trust in any compromise or agreement made with council because it can be easily changed without any notice or input from us. The Tatlock community would have to always be on guard, scrutinizing the council meeting agendas and budget presentations for a change in said agreement. None of us in the Tatlock community want to live that way. As the conversations progressed from 2018 to today, no one who will be directly impacted day in and day out by the proposed lights have been included in the discussions in any meaningful way. They have not been placed on subcommittees, consulted in an advisory capacity, or had the chance to work collaboratively and bring some perspective to the designers of this project. The DCP's own stated progression of steps does not leave room for a genuine assessment of whether these lights even belong in a residential neighborhood to begin with. Their website and FAQs have made it clear that the lights are coming to Tatlock and our concerns do not carry any weight. That is why this whole process still looks and feels very much 
like a dog and pony show from the, from the Tatlock neighbor perspective. I urge council and the DCP to take a deeper look into the harmful daily impact lights will have on the Tatlock community and reconsider whether it is proper to even move forward any further with this proposal at all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Name. Hi, uh, Dory Gagnon, 27 Bedford Road. So I come up here because this is the third project that's been down by Washington School. That's This one's kind of affected me, but not as much as oratory prep. That's right across the street from me. And the lower high school field, that's right down the street from me. So I understand where all the residents are upset. Um, but one thing that everybody here has to understand is that they have the time to come up and speak to you guys. Um, oratory prep was the planning board or the zoning board, I don't remember, it was almost 10 years ago. And we didn't really have a say, we had to compromise with them and it was a done deal. But I have a field with lights and I have a school now across the street from me. And I went to Sergeant Daly and I got a petition with my neighbors and I worked with him on the parking on my street. So that's something that you guys should do now on your street to get ahead of all of the traffic. That's what I urge you to do now. I would talk to the chief before it's a problem because that was something that I did to take initiative. Um, that's something I suggest. The other thing is that um, the, the turf on the high school, the Board of Ed didn't listen to us. Many of us came to the Board of Ed meetings and said, we didn't want the turf. We didn't want it because they're putting a new sign on the entrance of Morris Avenue with a new entrance and there's no parking there and we're very worried of the kids crossing the street, parking on Bedford Road and crossing on Morris Avenue. And with that are gonna come lights. And with that is more traffic and more concern for kids or someone getting hurt. Because what the parents are gonna do is drop their kids off and say, go ahead Johnny, cross the street, go to practice. And then you said there's putting more lines and more lines or they're gonna put soccer balls and then kiss them on, kick them onto Morris Avenue or lacrosse balls. I was a coach, I was a high school, I was a college athlete, I get it, we want sports. Um, with the lights down on Tatlock, I don't really have a say or a concern, but I do have a say and concern with the traffic and the safety um, and kids playing sports till 10 o'clock at night. So I think we have to look at everything in a whole and putting everything down on our side. Memorial Field, I'm sorry for you parents over there, you're not gonna like this, but that field has to have a whole redo and stuff has to be start happening over there. Our area has to stop. The traffic and the, con like the congestion down by us is ridiculous. So please take consideration and look at Memorial Field. I would really appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis and Harry L, 140 Broad Street, uh, Summit, New Jersey. Good evening. As a resident of 34 years in Summit and based on my experience as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Air Force, a district manager at New York Telephone, and 45 years as a pastor, in this climate in which people seize on every word spoken, sometimes it's good to know when a personal appearance will not serve the intended purpose because the bill has already been decided and whatever you say could be broadcast over social media over the world, then don't beat a dead horse. Consider the side effects. In this case, it is my honest opinion that three letters from Mayor Fagan and Council President uh, Allen and Councilwoman uh, Hamlet would have been enough and would not have resulted in the unfortunate feedback that resulted by your speaking in Trenton, even much of what you said had merit. Just brighten the corner where you are and do what is right for Summit, regardless of what the state of New Jersey does or does not do. Secondly, point of history, since the completion of the senior housing in Summit, there was a gap of some 30 years before a large affordable housing unit was completed in Summit. During this period, Summit used what is known as Regional Contribution Agreements, RCAs, to send housing trust fund monies to towns like Elizabeth and Plainfield 
to help them with their affordable housing. In 2008, while president of the Summit Interfaith Council, I, along with my colleagues, were successful in, set, in getting the Summit Common Council to discontinue this practice, as it sent the wrong message that you can work here, but you are not, we are not doing anything to help you live here. Isn't it interesting that in the bill A4, A4S50, this provision was permanently banned some 16 years after Summit stopped it? Thirdly, in 1989, I came to Summit as the pastor of Wallace Chapel Amy Zion Church, from Mayor Janet Whitman to now Mayor Fagan, and to every council, common council from 1989 to now. I have attempted to be an advocate of those moral principles that benefit every resident of Summit that coincide with my philosophy of number one, is there a need? Number two, is it doable? Pastor Harriel, you're at three minutes. And number three, is it the right thing to do? The proposed affordable housing project meets a need. It's doable and the right thing to do. You're I hope that the city of Summit will add this project to Weaver Street, Glenwood Place, and the senior building and build at home for Summit. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Gina Walsh, 24 Bedford Road. Um, I just want to say, knowing Lisa, Councilwoman Lisa Allen, I know that her words are definitely taken out of context because I've had many conversations about affordable housing with many people here because that's how I met my husband. He was living in affordable housing. When we got married, he was making $10,000 a year and he was, uh, he did have a little bit of money that he was able to buy, <coughs> excuse me, that he was able to buy um, affordable unit housing. From that was something that now we're able to actually have a nice house in Summit because of that opportunity that they were given. I think um, Summit should look at affordable housing for people to be able to buy because then they're really, they're making a little bit of money on it. Um, after my husband and uh, we had gotten married, I had a house, uh, he moved in. He sold his affordable housing unit to his brother who was just starting out. He had just gotten out of law school, had lots of bills. And I just think that's something that council should also look at. Um, another thing I want to talk about is <clears throat> the lighting. I live on Bedford Road and as Dory Gagnon had talked about, we live right in the backyard of Oratory Prep. And um, we were not given the opportunities to have open sessions like this. It was something that was not told to us. One of the neighbors had gotten a letter from someone who had gone to school there. So I do really appreciate that me living in the Tatlock community, that everybody is actually allowing people to come up and talk about different things and to try to come up with some sort of solution. One of the things that we did living on Bedford Road is, and I think that the people who do live in the, a little bit closer to the area on Butler Parkway, one thing that we don't have, we didn't have the buses on the street. Buses should be up at the high school or someplace else. They should not be in the community. We also um, have, uh, with the traffic, we have no parking at certain times, but oratory, if they're having an event, they put out signs and you're not allowed to park on one side of the street. I also do wish that Butler Parkway was, uh, that but, uh, Bedford Road was as wide as Butler Parkway. Our street really isn't that wide, and when we did have two um, lanes, a fire truck couldn't come down, but I do think there's an opportunity for the people on Butler to come up with something like that. Also, trees. We went to Oratory. I look right onto their ugly blue roof, but years and years later, it's really not as bad as we all thought that it was gonna be because um, oratory worked with us. I really do love hearing the kids outside. Um, one other thing is that Friday Night Lights is not gonna happen unless this project goes through. Talking to um, the AD and different people like that because there is issues with having lights all the way up to the bathrooms, all the way up to Washington Field. My son's the football captain next year, and unfortunately, he's never going to be able to experience the Friday Night Lights. Ma'am, your time's I understand up. that people do want to have Friday Ma Night Lights. Ma'am, you're three minutes. They were great, uh, agree with it, but I just think that everyone should work together a little bit more and get a solution. Thank you.
Regina, do you want to give your statement? Do you want to give your statement to Rosemary? Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you need that. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, Hi, Rachel. Oh, hey. Hey. Rachel Kramer, 88 um, Elm Street, Summit, New Jersey. So, so much. Um, first, I do want to thank all of you guys up there. I know what you do is not easy, it's not paid, it's often um, thankless, but I appreciate you guys. I appreciate Department of Community Programs. Um, so thanks for that. I'm not gonna apologize for anybody's words, just like nobody apologized for Diego's words when he said that 100% affordable housing would lead to ghettoization. Um, you guys are adults and you speak for yourselves. Um, thank you, Michael Rogers, for kind of explaining why Maple might not make sense this year. And thank you, Mr. Jacoby, for explaining the ordinance in a bit more detail last week. Um, so that being said, I've, I've been to these meetings for a while. Um, three minutes should be enforced. Thank you guys, you didn't enforce it in the beginning. People alluded to midnight ride meetings. I don't really know what that meant, but um, I think that this will help make meetings more efficient. So thank you for that as well. I've been in um, coming to meetings for years and advocating for more affordable housing when Broad Street West was part of the discussion. I asked a lot of questions about why minimum 15% um, was being considered and we were told financial decisions and that was all that was required by law. Um, I was sitting in meetings where people came up, addressed the council, talked about redlining, and then in the next breath talked about the multiple properties that they owned in Summit that they used as um, additional revenue streams. So I don't know if those are rented out at affordable rates or not, but I've noticed that it's really easy to come up here and signal virtuosity instead of actually being virtuous yourself. So I saw something, and um, it's not scripture, but it made me think of a lot of what's been going on in these meetings and how does moral narcissism show up in social and political discourse. Moral narcissism is best identified by causing harm in the name of virtue. In the realm of social justice advocacy, virtue is often attached to social or political causes. Moral narcissism atops a cause, usually many, many, and weaponizes those causes to abuse, shame, ostracize, cancel, and punish those who defy their ideologies. The difference between altruism and moral narcissism is that altruism does not cause harm for harm, nor does it use labels to crush dissent. It is, it is people cure centered and focuses on engaging and enlightening. Moral narcissism, on the other hand, causes harm under the guise of curing harm because the primary motivation is not to cure harm but to, but to project inner feelings of guilt and shame onto others while using a weapon, the cause to sanitize their own actions as virtuous. In this way, not only does moral narcissism- Ms. Kramer, you're three minutes. Okay, sorry, thank you so much. And um, Dory, yes, Memorial Field, I'm there. I'll help. Name, Kevin, address, and three Kevin minutes. Kevin McGoey, 113 Woodland <laughs> Avenue. Um, Greg, maybe now Diego will understand why you moved the comments till the end of the meetings when you were president. Um, I just want to make sure that it's quite clear and it's kind of frustrating that the issues with the bills that Lisa and Elizabeth and Delia went down to speak about in Trenton wasn't against affordable housing. It was about the policies by which they were, it was implemented in building. Um, and I think all of the council people were against it, I'm pretty sure. Andy was against it, I'm pretty sure. Greg was against it, Democratic leaders, and Westfield were against it, Democratic leaders, and Chatham were against it. It's pretty universally bad for municipalities because you lose control, and the issue then becomes overdevelopment. It was very clear that those were the issues that you were talking about, um, Lisa. And it's shameful that people mischaracterize that. Some people, I can understand, would not understand the bills and what the issues were with it. Um, but unfortunately, we have people in Summit, and these are the people I think Nora spoke about when she said, just watch every word, because people are looking for something to pounce on. Well, the president of the Summit Municipal Democratic Committee knows full well what, this, what these bills were. She works for a nonprofit that's goal is really to urbanize towns like ours, these transit-oriented developments. 
her firm is for this. So um, Lacey Cotter wrote an article and posted it into InsiderNJ.com entitled, Summit's Council President, Affordable Housing Increases Crime. She, she knows full well what the issues that you had were. She understood you weren't talking about affordable housing, but she writes this article anonymously, then posts it. Then there is an, also an article by Tom Moran of the Star Ledger, who writes something very similar, and then he writes mis completely factual and accurate things about our zoning, about our history. He talks about how Habitat for Humanity is kept out of cities like Summit. I don't even know if the guy understood that we just finished a Habitat for Humanity housing. Well, the Summit Municipal Democratic Committee, Lacey, posts this to their site, posts her article to the site. This is her article. This was given to me by the first gentleman that spoke. And he, and when he was damning you, and I said, did you listen to what she said? He goes, no, I read an article. <laughs> Handed me the article, and then my friend, angry friend back there ripped it up. But this is it. So he came in damning you because he read Lacey's article. Now, Lacey's name isn't on this. Why? You know, I mean, like, we need to be honest. Like, this, this, div this dividing and attacking, and I don't understand what, why it's political. I don't understand what the political motivations are. They're not, you know, you're not winning elections Mr. McGill, by attacking three people. Minutes. Okay, Thank sorry. You. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? We have. <laughs> okay. If we have no other comments, I'm going to close the comments and we're going to take a break for the council. All right. Public comments are closed.
Okay, I'm going to bring this meeting back to order. Um, okay, so we're going to start with ordinances for hearing. Madam Clerk, please read the ordinance. Ordinance number 24-3309, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank. Excellent. Councilman Miniger. Thank you, Council President. This is an ordinance to allow the city to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and establish a cap bank. State law establishes two limits to what a city can increase uh, to what a city can increase their budget. Two caps on the revenue side of the budget: property tax increases are limited two percent over the prior year's tax levy, and on the expense expenses side of the budget, appropriations increases are limited to three and a half percent over the prior year's appropriations. This ordinance deals with that appropriations limit. It allows for an increase of appropriations up to that limit, and then any difference between the actual final appropriations amount and that 3.5% increase amount will still be, of, still be able to utilize in the event of an unforeseen circumstance because we will have banked that difference. No actual money is sitting in a bank, we are, but we are reserving that leftover appropriations increase amount for an unexpected future need for up to two budget years. We are not planning to exceed this cap. This is an important step the city takes every year, giving us that extra appropriations wiggle room should we ever need it. I move to open the hearing on this ordinance. Okay, the hearing is open. Any uh, We need a second. Oops. Second. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council comments? Public comments? Okay, hearing none, we'll close the hearing. Thank you. Um, ordinances for final consideration, Madam Clerk. Ordinance number 24-3309, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank. Excellent. Um, Madam, um, Councilman Miniger, sorry. Thank you, Council President. <laughs> Having held the hearing just moments ago, I move this ordinance for final adoption. Excellent. Roll call, please. I need a second. Oh, second. Sorry. Thank you. Jumping faster to me. Mr. Boyer? Yay. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. Mr. Pulowski? Aye. Mr. Smallwood? Aye. Mr. Bartan? Aye. President Allen? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to ordinances for introduction. Madam Clerk, please read the first ordinance. Uh, ordinance ID number 11126, an ordinance amending the code, Chapter 7, Traffic, Section 7-8.7, .7, Parking Prohibited at All Times on Certain Streets. Excellent. Thank you. Councilman Boyer? Thank you, Council President. Uh, ID number 11126, an ordinance. Uh, this ordinance will... Um, this ordinance will address the parking on Blackburn Road between Blackburn and Prospect Street, uh, Locust Avenue. Um, I move this ordinance for introduction. Do I have a second? <coughs> second. Thank you. Okay. Um, council comments? No, okay. Uh, public comments? Uh, we don't take public comments on. No, we don't. Uh, yeah. I Sorry. actually have a quick question. Sorry to yep, throw absolutely. away. Um, did we take out the four hour I know initially we were doing the four hour parking on the other side. There was like an addition. Did that come out? Yes. So we're <coughs> leaving the, the remainder of the street the same as it is now. Okay. So the only thing that's changing is from the, the intersection of Prospect to 210 feet. So right past the driveway, driveway where the obstruction was. But we haven't made any changes to the two hour parking that was requested initially. No? No. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, roll call vote, please. Mr. Boyer? Yay. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. Mr. Pulaski? Aye. Mr. Smallwood? Aye. Mr. Vartan? Aye. President Allen? Aye. Okay. The hearing will be on April 2nd. Madam Clerk, pl please read the next ordinance. Ordinance ID number 11172, an ordinance amending the code chapter 4, general licensing <coughs> section 4-2. 20 regulating of sidewalk cafes. Okay, Councilman Pulaski. This is ID number 11172. The city code sets forth the fee structure for sidewalk cafes in two places. One is in Appendix A, the fee schedule of the city code, and the second is in Chapter 4 of the city code. We recently learned that the latter needed updating so that the two are consistent. This is an ordinance to amend <coughs> Chapter 4. Subsection 4-20.3's fee schedule to match that of Appendix A. I move to introduce this ordinance. 
Do I have a second? Second. Uh, council comments? Okay, hearing none, roll call vote please. Mr. Boyer? Aye. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Uh, Mr. Excuse Miniger? Excuse me. Is this just for introduction? Yeah. I'm sorry, for introduction. We vote on this? Yeah. yeah. The you have to vote on introduction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I Sweet. believe I left off at Mr. Miniger. Aye. Uh, Mr. Pulaski? Aye. Mr. Smallwood? Aye. Mr. Vartan? Aye. President Allen? Aye. Okay. The hearing will be on April 2nd. On to resolution. Uh, actually, what I'd like to do, um, according to our city solicitor, I'd like to make a motion to move the whole agenda under consent. Um, and if we do that, I would like to get, take a motion in a second, and we can discuss any resolutions under the consent. Um, That's correct. Right? Okay. So I'd like to make a, have a motion. So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Great. Any discussion on any of the items? Any discussion? Yes. Yes. <laughs> City Administrator Rogers. Uh, I would like to include for the personnel policies that we include quarterly reports in the one section that we spoke about on, on, earlier. On sick leave utilization. On sick leave utilization, yes. Yep. I would like to memorialize that we would like to see a formal uh, quarterly report to what. Uh, that, that, that can, we can accomplish that, no, no that's problem. It. I yep. think that was it. So that's noted and that will be done. And, and uh, Kirk Lickatees, you should take a, a roll call vote on the whole agenda. Okay. I, I have one more question. Sorry. Okay. This is, um, Rose, Rosemary, this is for you. The sidewalk cafe chain, what was the problem with the sidewalk cafe costs and fees? I just, I was looking at it and I couldn't okay, figure it out. Okay, so uh, the, we recently revised Schedule A of fees okay. in the code. Yep. And um, it was discovered when I was reviewing one of the resolutions uh, for sidewalk cafes that um, Chapter 4 dash 20.3 showed two fee structures, one for restaurants with liquor licenses and one without. And the fee schedule didn't reflect the same fee structures. Okay. So in order to make them consistent, we needed to amend the ordinance so that now they, they will both have the same fee structures in both sections. Okay, thank you. Yes. And before I move on, I just wanna make sure there are no other questions for resolutions from council. Are there any resolutions you guys wanna talk about? No? Okay. Okay. I just want to give it um, public comment, an opportunity. Anybody? Okay. Roll call, please. Mr. Boyer? Aye. Ms. Hamlet? Aye. Mr. Miniger? Aye. Mr. Pulaski? Aye. Mr. Smallwood? Aye. Mr. Vartan? Aye. President Allen? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Um, we're going to move on to council member comments, new business. Um, Councilwoman Hamlet. Sure. Uh, yes, I, I wish not everybody had left because I, I did have some comments about Trenton. Uh, for the last several months, we have all been watching a rushed bill come out of Trenton uh, that our city administrator actually mentioned at the last council meeting that lacked municipal input. If you go back to last Sunday night, I called Mayor Fagan and I asked her if she was going to Trenton. At the time, we had no idea what time the bill would have been discussed in Trenton. There was a ton on the agenda that day, including the OPA reform bill. I believe Mayor Fagan had also recently returned home from her mother-in-law's funeral, probably that weekend. On Monday, the day of the vote in Trenton at 3 p.m., the mayor had a wedding to perform. Our conversation on Sunday discussed who would do the wedding. If the bill was discussed at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m., would it be her or me? I think I even texted uh, Councilman Vartan that morning seeing if he had any thoughts or wanted to go down, if he was going down to Trenton. Uh, Monday a.m., she got the wedding moved to 4 p.m., which allowed the three of us a little more flexibility in racing home, picking up kids, and we felt better about the mayor being able to conduct the wedding depending on when the bill was introduced. For those of us who think it's easy to speak at a public meeting in Trenton, it's a little trickier than you may think. The amendments to the bill are listed very quickly, and it's difficult to take a massive bill and digest all of the amendments right on the spot. I was sitting next to our attorney, Jeff Serenian, and we were both diligently taking a look at the amendments and scribbling down what changed. This can impact your comments instantly. With all of that being said, I think the bill was introduced sometime after 11. Initially, Chairman Sarlo uh, was going to limit our comments from Summit, New Jersey to one. As you know, you only have three minutes. In my opinion, I wanted to give Summit, if we could, nine minutes. 
So we got nine minutes that day. The mayor got her three minutes to give her statement as the mayor of Summit. I spoke about the lack of municipal input, expressed strong concerns about the proposed legislation, highlighting issues such as reduced municipal immunity from zoning laws, changes to agreed upon affordable housing numbers post approval, and increased litigation risks. There is a reason we have a judgment of compliance and repose, which I just got a copy of last week. This week. And then, but not, then last but not least, Council President Lisa Allen. While I cannot speak for Council President Lisa Allen, I will tell you that she is one of the kindest human beings I know. She spends countless hours advocating for residents throughout Summit, regardless of race, background, or economic status. I truly think Lisa was so excited to make the connection between the passionate residents for and against Tatlock Lights because she was telling me that all week. And she was trying to make the connection between what our residents are currently talking about as it relates to overdevelopment or current community projects. She was by no means connecting affordable housing to crime and is certainly not a racist. I wish residents understood how painful it has been to watch our current Summit Housing Authority residents and the conditions in which some of their homes are in. When these Summit Housing units are rehabilitated, the summits will, Summit residents will lose their residency preference. That is just a fact. Any affordable housing in Summit will be affirmatively marketed. marketed. Again, that's just a fact, but I want it to be clear that nothing we build will give Summit residents a preference. Again, this is simply just a fact, and I want to make sure the community is clear. I wanted to make a, co a couple of comments, and I'll be brief, on some of the resident feedback that we listened to today. First, if you were here and you gave a public comment and you asked a request, these meetings are sometimes four hours long. And although we can go back and try to remember absolutely every single request, please send us an email. Please send our city clerk an email. We do our best to remember, but please send an official request. It's better for everybody. Um, one of the things that I heard a lot of the residents talk about with Tatlock Lights, uh, which is frustrating for me, is um, they make some good points around ordinances that can be repealed by another council. And I think we should, we should think about that and have dialogue around that. Um, something that I asked that would be put in our committee, I asked for this last week, is in the planning board, uh, the capital improvements program per the MLUL, the governing body may authorize the planning board to develop a program of municipal capital improvements for a minimum of six years to take into account future public facility needs based on potential development identified in the master plan or permitted by municipal ordinance. So I would ask that we take that and we really think about which projects should go to the planning board and which projects should remain with council. I think that's something that we should just think about as we're evaluating Tatlock because I think some of their comments tonight were important. Um, I would like to get a copy of the minutes that um, resident Solano mentioned, the redacted committee minutes. Uh, as a council member, I believe I can see the unredacted version, so I'd like to officially request a copy of those. Uh, I would recommend that Aubrey and Lewis is a DAR if it's not. Sounded like that's a concerning problem. Uh, Councilman Boyer, I'll, I, I just, I'm not familiar with that area. I don't know if the chief is or not. Um, I think Mr. Bossman made some really good comments tonight. For the first time, we may actually be agreeing. I thought he made some really excellent comments. and. I can't quite capture all of them, but I remember when he was up here, I think they were really good comments. Um, I actually asked Chief Evers last week if Butler Parkway, I think uh, Councilman Smallwood, you were talking to me about Butler Parkway and whether or not the, the fire trucks could get through. I think it was maybe you, I can't remember. But he did say that the fire trucks could get through, but now that I'm hearing all these comments, I just wanna make sure that fire trucks can get through. It sounds like it's really crowded. I think it's Lewis. Was it Lewis? Lewis. Okay, I'm wrong. Um, and then to the resident who, I think her name was Jocelyn, I forget her last name. Uh, I was only simply pointing out to the meeting in 2018 that that was the original meeting. I was certainly by no means saying uh, that that was the appropriate or only meeting to have a genuine assessment on Tatlock. So for the record, I was just pointing out that it just didn't come up this year. So sorry for the long-winded comments, but I just want to make sure that we captured everything. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your comments, Councilwoman. Yep. Through you, Council President. Yeah. Um, uh, so Mr. Bennett, Mr. Jim Bennett asked a couple questions about the next steps in the budget process and I wanted to um, include those. There he is. Thank you. Thank you for nodding. Um, so the, uh, we do still, we do have a final budget to still discuss in committee, uh, probably one, one to two more times. Um, and then I, uh, I believe it's April, correct me if I'm wrong, April 8th? April 2nd. April 2nd the is the introduction to the budget. 
um, and that will be, um, yeah, that'll be the first chance for the for the city to to see that. And then there'll be a, um, I believe it's. You know, it's May seventh. I'm Thank not you. looking at the calendar, but it's the first meeting in May. Yeah. yeah. May seventh. Thirty days. Yeah. So. It will be the hearing. That's our process, um, and I'm I'm absolutely willing to meet with you. You asked if you you could meet, so yeah, I would I would gladly do that. Delia just said she would do that same. So. Um, and then uh, also, Mr. Bassman's comment, I wanted to ask if it would be possible to expand that. I know 200 feet is the minimum requirement, and that's kind of how, um, like, say, projects, zoning projects, they're required to notify you know, 200 feet. Uh, thank you. Um, but in this case, I was wondering if we could just go a little bit beyond that, expand it to 500 or 1,000 feet. It makes sense to do that, especially with, with lights. You're talking about catwalk? Yeah, yeah, if we could just expand so the group. Is the minimum, that's what's required by law. You can be, um, you know, to make sure that everyone in the community knows and is aware of it. What, whenever you get to that point, you could g g expand it and, and send it out uh, much broader than 200 feet. Yeah, I think we should. It, it makes sense to do it with this one. Yeah. And Councilman Mittager, I, I, I totally agree with you. In fact, you know, with the, the four meetings that we have set up in April, for the, uh, the just the Tatlock residents only, it, it does include expanded beyond 200 feet. You know, because it includes Aubrey Lewis, uh, Greenfield, and uh, Butler Parkway, as well as the two side streets. I think off of Butler Parkway. So that's great. We did want to keep it local to the the Tatlock residents, but it certainly expands more than 200 feet. Thank you very much. Is that it? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to talk about public comment and um, it seems like there may be some confusion out there about uh, this council and its commitment to public comment. Um, we had over three hours, I think, tonight of public oh, comment. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, we allow public comment during the open public comment period. One shot, three minutes. We also allow public comment after presentations. One shot, three minutes for each presentation. We allow public comment after hearings on ordinances. One shot up to three minutes. We allow public comment on resolutions. Um, one shot up to three minutes. And we also allow public comment on the consent agenda one shot up to three minutes. I can't imagine that former council president Vartan ever let me speak twice during the open public comment period. I'm guessing maybe I spoke about a resolution or an ordinance and during the public comment period if I ever did come up twice, but you could come up many times. Um, there are some councils that do the bare minimum that's required by law and they allow a single public comment period, that's it. There are councils and boards out there who are subject to the same Open Meeting, Open Public Meetings Act as we are, and the same uh, municipal code as we are, who allow a limited public comment period, an hour. If you don't get up there within the hour, tough luck. I've heard of one that was 20 minutes. I've heard of a school board that requires you to sign up in advance, otherwise you're not allowed to speak. So. Um, These all sound like really good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I've also been told by the city solicitor that we all need to have our heads examined <laughs> for not adopting one of those other <laughs> procedures, but we're very committed to public comment, lest there be any confusion, and that's one of the reasons why we moved public comment to the beginning also. Uh, so folks wouldn't have to wait until we get through all of our business. And uh, as we've seen in the first, I don't know, what have we had, six meetings? Um, public comment is as robust as ever, and we probably wouldn't have had to sit through as much public comment had we left it at the end of the meeting. So I just wanted to make that clear for everybody out there. Okay. Thank you. Comments? Council well, comments. anybody with money on 11 o'clock has lost it, so, so that's, that's Delia and Andy's fault. I think uh, we purposely threw it. Yeah, he was any, saying he was gambling with, on 11. Anybody with money on 11. Uh, so I, I just 
I just want to talk about a few things. So, um, following up on, on your comments, Delia, so the, the, the statute that you were referring to about the planning board, I think that's the, the uh, that, that the planning board can do a courtesy review, mm -hmm. right, of the projects yeah. that we're considering. Just want to make it clear we're not, we're not abdicating responsibility Correct. by saying the planning yeah. board can go handle it, mm -hmm. you know, let no. them do it, and, and not, a, we're ultimately going to have to, you know, yeah. yeah. So, so, and I think, you know, for things like the Tatlock, uh, for things like the, uh, the cross wall at Tatlock, um, they're going to do that courtesy review, right? So that's, I think, always uh, helpful. Um, the second thing uh, just had to do with the housing authority. Um, the properties at the housing authority, so people know the housing authority is going through uh, the process of RAD 2, right, which is where they get um, funding sources to try to renovate the properties. Um, the, you're right that we will lose, some residents will lose the residency preference, but smartly what the housing authority did, I think it was last year or the year before, was freeze the list where it is. So right now there is a summit preference. So everybody at the top of the list is summit residents now, and that, and that list is frozen. So those people that are already on the list will be first to get into those uh, housing units as they become available. Um, and then the, you know, the third thing um, is just to talk about this, uh, the, the bill for just a second, which is that other towns, uh, other towns that testified um, and, and towns that have had representatives come here and talk about the bill have uh, rightly expressed their concerns about round four, right? But they've, a lot of those towns, like Chatham and Westfield, they've met their obligation for round three, and we have not done that. So, so we do, I think, need to pretty quickly provide an update to the community about where we are on vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, this Mount Laurel committee, uh, you know, what what kinds of recommendations are coming to council, where, you know, wh what is the, the advice and opinion of that group about this at home and summit proposal that we keep getting uh, comments about, you know, because I, you know, I think uh, actions certainly speak louder than words, right? And if we don't want to be perceived as a town that is against affordable housing, then we should just build affordable housing. We should meet our round three obligation and get that done. So that's what I think we should do. That's my, those are my three things for today. Thank you. Councilman, uh, do you know what Chatham's um, obligation was by chance? Not off the top of my head, no. But they met it? You said they told I think a lot, so, uh, I, yes, my understanding is they've met round three. I, I don't want to talk about specific towns, other, other obligations, but my understanding is that a lot of the towns around us have met their round three obligation. Is there a way to find out um, how, what other towns around us have, made, have met their obligation? I don't know if Fair Share, does Fair Share do a? Fair Share probably has it. I, I'm, I'm sure Jeff Serenian would be able to oh, get that okay. information. That would be helpful. That would be helpful. They would definitely, yeah. he, would, he would have it, or he'd have the ability to find that out quickly. Okay, and without naming a town, there was a town that I talked to who said their only obligation was 30. 30, yeah, I mean, three zero, it, that was it. A lot of it depends too, just on, on you know, how much vacant land you have, where you can build it. Um, you know, in some ways, you, you, you as a town, um, it, it's unfortunate. You have lots of affordable housing that you've given to your residents over the years that's affordable, but none of it counts mm -hmm. in, 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 their, in the methodology that they utilize. So, um, but I think Jeff Serenian could probably tell you, I think they keep track of it, and they represent a lot of the towns around here. They can probably tell you what, who's met it, who hasn't. If I can tell you there's a lot of towns that haven't, um, or there's towns that I've, are just, I'm involved in one right now, where they're, they're just settling it now. They're selling their third round now, but there involves a 194 acre corporate campus that was vacated. Mm -hmm. So it's only you know, 1,400 units well, on that one property. 1,400? On that one property. Wow. I see you got a hand. 
Council. So um, I do want to take exception with something that uh, Councilman Vartan just Wait, said. Councilman Plosky, please oh, yeah, hold. Sorry. Because um, I will come back to you because not everybody has had a chance uh, okay, to speak. Sorry. So, yeah, just give me a second. Because what I did want to say is um, the one thing I'd like to look into is the Aspire credits um, uh, grants that you, I think you've dug into quite a bit. So the question is, is do the Aspire grants, we are trying to seek those for the RFPs on um, the Housing Authority. And tonight I heard, I think that um, the summit at home also wants Aspire credits. So Mike, I would be interested in making sure that those, that grant money um, can, that go anywhere, right? Like, is there a limitation on towns on how much money they can get from the Aspire grants if that's the way that we're looking for funding? Because the housing authority um, absolutely should get Aspire grants this year and we should take Absolutely, um, we should not take no for it. We should take yes for it, whatever. Um, we should make sure we get a grant for our housing authority um, because they are way overdue and we need to get those RFPs done. I've heard it for a year that, you know, we had an executive director leave and we're, you know, there's a little bit of movement, but that's not acceptable. We've done RFPs, it's time to get the job done, and if we really are truly gonna put our money where our mouth is to affordable housing, we're gonna make sure that our housing authority residents live with some dignity and make sure they get that money this year. So, uh, council, I'm sorry, Councilman Bartan, are you done? I, I interrupted you, that was very rude of me. Uh, I think I was done. Okay, all right, Councilman Boyer. I think tonight, um finally at a loss for words. Um, there's so much to say and no, it's so late, late but <laughs> I, I will say that, um, you know, I, people come up and they, you know, double talk is, is something that is just really unbelievable, right? It's, uh, you know, it's speaking in a way that's kind of confusing. Um, making it appear to be like um, you're coming off a certain way and not being accountable for what you're saying. Um, and then, you know, you, you sit back down. And what I'm referring to is the, the comments that were, or the, or the gesture um, that was referred to me when um, someone said that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't black. On one side you had somebody say, well, that's debatable. And this person, looking right at him, several people called me that night. I mean, am, am, I, am I imagining things? I don't think so. But um, it's funny that accountability only works one way, right? We are to be accountable, but other people are not. Now, when it comes to uh, affordable housing, I'm not going to move on from that because I'm not going to keep going back into that, that circumstance. Um, when it comes to affordable housing, you know, I believe that the Mount Laurel Doctrine um, was initially crafted, even though I, I don't think it said it in the original document anywhere about race. I believe it was crafted um, about race to deal with uh, the black communities that could not build multifamily dwellings. Um, today, I think we've lost the essence of that. I mean, we are uh, a, a much more ethnically diverse nation. Um, there are multi multiple different cultures in America now. And affordable housing is not just for black people. Um, and that, to me, um, is a little bit problematic because Folks come up here and we talk about redlining and we talk about historical injustices. But however, will black people actually benefit from the multiple apartment dwellings and buildings that are gonna go up throughout the state? Um, will, will, they, will there be room for the, the black folks who are in Newark and Trenton? Or will this be expanded to all different types of people that we declare minorities today. And listen, I'm, I, I believe in uh, equal share for everyone. I think my, my point is though that I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little tired of people coming up and leveraging 
the historical wrongs against black people to push affordable housing when white people may not even benefit from it. I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's sad. I think it's disingenuous. Now, when it comes to summit, I think all, well, I'm gonna speak for myself. What I'd like to see is, I, I'd like to see achievable goals. All you have to do is give us achievable numbers. I mean, look at our community. Each community is different. It shouldn't be a top-down approach. What can we do in Summit? Take into account our affordable housing that we already have here. Take into account Glenwood. Take into account Weaver Street and our senior citizens building. And take into account our density. I mean, it sounds so simple to me. But with the government, everything is just a one-size-fits-all um, prospect, and you just have to take it or leave it. And when we talk about data, 10 years from now, people are going to turn around and say, wow, look what we did to our suburbs. We destroyed them. We didn't know what we were doing, actually, at the time. Um, the other thing is uh, a resident made a comment about uh, affordable housing, that summit doesn't pay for affordable housing. I'm sure, sure we do. Taxpayers pay for it um, with this bill. Uh, the other comment that I want to make is um, council president, not really that bad of a night, actually. Uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> you, the, the supporters that came out for you, uh, I think, were amazing, especially <coughs> the ones on Weaver Street and Glenwood. Um, the things that they said, I mean, actual things that you and council uh, woman Hamlet have done actual things that you have done, not just said, but done. People that you actually helped. You know, it wasn't like an idea in your head. People actually came in and said, this is what you did for me. <coughs> Great job. The last thing I will say is, when, we, when people write articles and paint a broad brush and say, um, what do you expect from you know, the racist council? You know, I'm probably not quoting it right, but I think we get the essence. I'd like to say, when we talked that one night, uh, council president, I said, I asked you, I said, what's your story? What is your story? Because you know what I realize in life as a 46-year-old man is that everybody has a story. We all don't come with a silver spoon in our mouths, right? We all grow up from somewhere that we, we had to overcome something. What did you overcome? And your story was amazing. I don't know if I should tell you a story, <laughs> but it was amazing. It was one of it was one of struggle, right? It was one of um, someone waiting tables, paying their way through college, busting it, burning the midnight oil, right? Getting to where you need to go, appreciating the intelligence that you have and the motivation that came with inside of you to be here right now and to be sitting in that seat as council president. What an amazing job. And no one has the right to say anything about where you're coming from in your heart to call you the R word. I'm not even gonna say it anymore. But good job, good job. And congratulations too, you're doing a wonderful job here. And on this note, I'm gonna, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> We all. Thank you, Councilman Boyer. We we are we all here are for affordable housing. I I I'm definitely here for affordable. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for <laughs> affordable housing. So come, I mean, come on. Let's. I mean, let's. I'm gonna use a colloquial term here. Let's keep it real, right? Um, the only thing I'm saying is that summit residents are so special and that's why they did glenwood and weaver street because they knew that there was a specific need for a specific group of people and that's why i'm here what i'd rather us do is look at the needs of our town the people who we need to build houses for and 
pull their parents in, like my mother, um, like my buddy Brink Wathney, who lived in Fabian Place down the street from me, who I had a conversation with last night, you know, who's in D.C. doing great things. That brother wouldn't be alive either right now if it wasn't for Summit. But these are the people that we need to, we need to save, you know. Um, and I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Smallwood? Uh, I, I wasn't going to say anything, but however. I, there's one thing I, I do want to mention about affordable housing, and it's something that I've learned over the past, I guess, probably six months, is the fact that we could build as many affordable housing units as possible, and it still not affect one teacher, one police officer, one fireman, and some. Because it goes into a lottery system. So we could build 100 units, and out of those 100 units, it wouldn't benefit, it could not, because of the lottery system, it potentially could not benefit any of those, right? The appalling thing that I found, which I just found out tonight um, by Councilman Bartan, is the fact that when we do the renovation of these current affordable housing, that we're gonna lose residents. People who live here, who are going to have to move because of the renovations may not be able to come back to Summit. That's appalling. No, that's absolutely not true. Yeah, I'm uh, oh, that's, that's, that's absolutely not what oh, I was right. saying. I'm sorry. Maybe I no, misunderstood. The residency pre preference will okay. be gone in the sense that when new residents apply, okay. they, they will I'm, not be able to currently favor right. Summit residents. I, that is not what I meant. And the, okay. and the renovations, hopefully, wouldn't be any longer than a few days Correct. that people would be moving okay. out of there. Then I, I misunderstood yeah. you. So, because uh, yeah. that was the first Just time I heard that. Yeah. I, I totally misunderstood you. So I, I apologize because I was yeah. like, sorry if I wasn't like, clear. No, that, that, that was, I was like the first time I, I heard that I was like, wow, this, that, that's not going to be good. Um, but anyway, the, the, the fact about affordable housing is that I, I keep hearing, you know, we need it for our teachers, our policemen and our fire and our, our firemen, but it potentially couldn't even affect them. So, you know, affordable housing is, is extremely important. Unfortunately, I think part of the reasons why we don't have affordable housing is because we have developers that come in and we buy, they buy homes, they tear them down and build a $1.6 million house. I would love to be able to buy a house right now, but every time I try to go and buy a house, I get outbid. Sometimes it's actually been by a builder. Mm -hmm. They knock the house down and they build a $1.6 million house. It, that completely puts me out of the, I can't afford it. Um, so with that being said, Matt's kicking me uh, to stop Not talking. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I wanted to go back to, I know, we'll wrap up just shortly, but I just want to give you a chance because you wanted to say something. Council yeah, Council. so. Um, Sorry, no. I, you know, when we were campaigning, uh, Jamal and I both talked a lot about how great would it be to put 100% affordable housing at Broad Street West and guarantee it to our teachers, our police officers, our firemen. We didn't realize that you can't do that and still have it count towards our affordable housing numbers. Um, and so uh, to add on to Councilman Vartan's point about losing the preference once we do these renovations, um, we're also going to drop our unmet need by 195 units when we do those renovations. And I don't think a lot of people understand. What's that? What? You can say it in the, say it in the microphone. Um, Michael, that would be for rehab credit, though, right? Yeah, but you're getting, right. you still get those, those credits. Yeah, for, right. For no, you're, I, you're right. I, so I, I so, sure so you're when, right. when folks talk about our unmet need is so big and everything else, that's true, right? I mean, these are numbers that are put out there by fair share housing. Um, but, you know, everyone should know uh, also in the back of their minds that we have an additional 195 affordable housing units um, out there. Um, one last thing uh, that I took exception to uh, that Councilman Vartan said, I don't, I don't necessarily take exception to his opinion that uh, we haven't met our round three need, but I just want to make clear that that's not the position of the city. I don't want anybody to take a position on behalf of the city that we haven't satisfied our settlement agreement, which said that we would use reasonable efforts to facilitate the addition of 50 units. Um, and it, it, So we arguably have done that, 
if we wind up in a lawsuit or anything like that, I don't want anybody to uh, say that we made some kind of an admission that we haven't done that. Um, you know, you never know where these things are going to take us. That's it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, to your point, I sent actually Lisa Allen an email February 23rd, 2024, and I said, Lisa, it seems the public continues to be confused about our affordable housing obligation. With Jeff coming to closed session before the prior meeting, I'm recommending we come up with a statement that goes out to the public. We agreed to take all reasonable efforts, not even best efforts, to facilitate the construction of 50 units, not to ensure 50 be built. We did, th we did, through, we did so through zoning, putting ordinances in place to guarantee 15%, 20% of units in development, sorry, to be set aside for affordable housing. And I, I just want to... I guess, Rosemary, my question to you is, um, since I obtained that uh, judgment of compliance and repose, can we add that to the, can we, how do we get that to the public? Because I had never seen it, the actual document up until. We is the actual, post. was it on our website it's on previous? Our website. It's it on was? our website. It was just, it wasn't clear, but he's clarified it. Okay, so now it's on our website. So maybe we can just find, I hadn't seen the actual document, but I think it's important for the public to be able to see it. So if we can figure out a way to do that. I can talk to Amy about how it's, best to do that. Okay. Yeah, it, it's clearer on the affordable housing section. Um, it, it's been up there, but mm -hmm. it wasn't easy to so easy Probably. to find because there's a lot of documents, but I believe Matt Delory made it a little more prominent to That's see it. it so. But again, I think we're all, we all want affordable housing. That's very clear. And we will do our best efforts to obviously exceed that obligation. Thank you, Councilwoman. Okay, I am going to make a motion to adjourn. Oh. No, I get to talk. Oh. I promise I'll be fast, and I'm so patient. Um, no. so one, one thing, I'm sorry to keep you here any longer than you have to be here. Um, two things. One is, I just want to clarify, because I think the way I understood it when I spoke to you, Michael, today about sort of, I, I don't want there to be an outcry from the Summit Housing Authority residents that they're going to be displaced if we refurbish or renovate. So my understanding is they'll be mo temporarily moved out and then re remove back into the same unit or comparable one, right? And then if they choose or opt to move out, that would be when that unit would become available and become affirmatively marketed. That's, That's my correct. understanding, yes, correct. Okay. Is that your that understanding? That is, well, yes, yes. Okay, I just want to, I don't want anybody who currently lives in Summit Housing to believe that they're going to they're be bounced and suddenly not have a place to live. Yeah. That way um, I wanted to clarify that. We're a long way from... I understand that. Correct. I just wanted this to be, that to be clear, because that's my understanding. Yeah. I hope that's correct. That's my understanding. Um, and then the second thing I want to mention to the public who are concerned about affordable housing and are, are dying to, to help us as a community um, comply and, and really help to create these units is that if you happen to own a property and you would like to deed restrict it and you'd like to kind of donate it to the cause, we're all ears. Come on over. Talk to Matt DeLore. I mean, that's, that's a possibility, correct? That's something that could happen. If there's yes, a private property owner that is inclined to be very generous and help, the, help our cause for affordable housing, we'd love to hear from you. So those are my two things. And also, um, I want to say that I want to thank Lisa for being an excellent leader and I want to echo some of the things that were said about her heart because this woman has one of the biggest hearts I've ever known and ever met. And um, she, I've watched her with uh, working through some of the issues in the Summit Housing Authority buildings. And so I just want to be really clear about that. Um, and lastly, I have to say happy birthday to Christopher Harrison because his birthday is today, Amy Karen's husband. Don't, don't say, no, she, she, no, she, she, she said she, said she, she said, does want me to. She, said, she told me otherwise, but uh -oh. if you want to do it, uh -oh. Oh, we have I mean, to say, you're the council but, president. But also, happy birthday to Patrick <laughs> Allen I I, for we missing just, it we last time. Right. We Sorry. missed it. Sorry. Can we do it? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, we should. All right, come on. One, oh, no, no, happy birthday. All right, listen. One happy birthday. One happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pat Christopher and Pat Christopher. Happy birthday, Christopher. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Okay. Sorry, I'm all tight. Motion to adjourn. My gift to both is to have them out Second. Who's making the motion? Second. Who's making the motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Kevin did the motion to adjourn.
Second. And Greg seconded. Who seconded? It was Kevin Andy? and me. Oh, Kevin. And, I'm sorry, Kevin and Greg. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in, guys. Good night. <laughs>